Okay. All right. Okay. Welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'd like to welcome everybody here tonight to our infamous College of Complexes. There are two rules to the college. One is one fool at a time, and the second one is no personal attacks. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. First, we have a um, brief announcement session. Then we have our speaker who will speak up to about an hour. Then we have our um, rebuttal sessions where you each get to speak for a specified amount of time on anything on or off topic. And then after that, we will then adjourn about nine o'clock or so because we are on Zoom, we're not a hard and fast uh, nine o'clock adjournment, but uh, if we're ready, Charlie, if anybody has announcements, should we go to the order? Otherwise, Charlie, let's get started with the announcements. Okay, <laughs> welcome everyone to meeting number 3,000. 658 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. First of all, I want to remind everyone that we have an email Google group and a Yahoo meetup group. Uh, so you could sign up for either one of those or both and get a meeting a notice or two each mm -hmm. week on the upcoming programs. Now, although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs. We've got 10 of them right now on the den, 10 T-E-N. Coming next week, the 26th of March, Dan Lee uh, from our other campus will be returning. She usually puts together a very detailed uh, and interesting program. And she's gonna be talking about uh, the, the world, the presence of a yin-yang dynamism in the world. So that's March 26th. On April the 2nd, the Libertarian Party of Chicago will be presenting one of their candidates running for office in an upcoming election here in Chicago. Uh, and we'll be discussing uh, their party platform, April the 2nd. Now we transition into four programs, four special Earth Day Eco, -Eco programs beginning on the 9th, a Chicago organization called the One Earth Collective. Now that's a good name, good socialist name, I would think, April 9th. April the 16th, a uh, gentleman will be discussing the uh, advantages, he's an advocate of using hydrogen as a source of power. Mm -hmm. On the 23rd, uh, the Illinois Green Party, We'll be listening to the candidates. They are running for office concerning water, water uh, like reclamation. And on the 23rd, yours truly, we'll be discussing forestry you mean and the need to preserve and restore U.S. forests. You mean on the 30th? Habitat, I am proving there's a primitive species who is occupying the forest of the United States definitive proof. Transitioning into May, our special May Day speaker this year will be the IWW, the Industrial Workers of the World, which is meeting tomorrow, if anyone's interested, at one o'clock, the Chicago chapter. That's on May 2nd, our May Day program. On May the 14th, the Truth Brigade, will be here. I know you all embrace the truth as I do. Some of you don't, but the Truth Brigade will be discussing um, their activities regarding uh, the information that's being presented out there and how to recognize disinformation. Okay, let's see. The fourth, oh, uh, the 21st. Now we've had a program change. A program change, and there's a project to uh, collect data and alert people to health disparities regarding COVID-19. This should be an interesting program. Uh, the health disparities, that's on the 21st. So please note, we've had a program change. And last of all, on the 28th, um, there's an activity to combat an effort, they're very active around Chicago metro area 
to combat uh, disinformation mm -hmm. uh, put forth by uh, certain forces on the right and Republican to disrupt and control curriculums and so forth. So that should be a good program on the 28th. Our next open, we have four open dates in June, 4, 11, 18, 25. And last of all, I'm gonna remind you that we have a video page of uh, videos. They're all free and online have been recommended by various speakers. So check that out. And that's good, Tim, you gotta tell us about the rules and regulations of the college. Thank I, I you. did already. But just to re briefly review, um, it is one fool at a time. And a second rule is no personal attacks. Uh, most of you already know this. So uh, without further ado, uh, D, if you wanna get started on your speech, go right ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Just a reminder to please silence yourselves during the presentation part. Okay. okay. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Dee Knight, uh, author of My Whirlwind Lives, Navigating Decades of Storms. Um, and uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Charlie and Tim for inviting me to speak to you at the College of Complexes. I attended last week's session, so now I'm a veteran and I have so many complexes, I could probably get a master's at the College of Complexes. Uh, I really do appreciate this opportunity to present my book. Uh, let me just say that uh, it is due out on the 1st of June, but uh, there are some advanced copies available at uh, uh, the People's Forum's 1804 Books in New York. That's available online at 1804books.com slash products slash my whirlwind lives. Um, and before, I, I'm hoping that I can actually read some excerpts. Uh, I showed you the book. I don't know if you can see it, but uh, you'll notice that it has a number of pages flagged. I'll be uh, uh, browsing through for excerpts that you might find interesting. Uh, perhaps first I'll share some blurbs uh, that give a sense of who likes it. Um, Medea Benjamin, the co-founder of Code Pink says, my whirlwind lives is a fast paced and fascinating tour of a life filled with politics, passion, and purpose. Mm -hmm. um, the author takes us through decades of turmoil in the US and overseas, and decades of movement building against war, injustice, and destruction of the planet. I'd also like to mention that my uh, uh, young friend, Steve Grossman, who we've been close now for a little over 50 years, having met in Toronto back in 1971, uh, and I'm very uh, pleased and proud that he's here, especially since he could well have co-authored a substantial part of this book, as you will see it, at least part of it. Um, I'd also like to mention a blurb from our other close friend, Jerry Condon, uh, former president of Veterans for Peace, who says uh, the book is a compelling account of my personal odyssey and political evolution from a high schooler for Barry Goldwater, then dropping out of college in 1968 to campaign for Eugene McCarthy, uh, then became a, a leading Vietnam War resistor in Canada, witnessed revolutions in Portugal and Nicaragua, and became a committed socialist. Uh, this life story shares much of that of thousands of young people whose lives and worldviews changed when they were pushed to participate in unjust US wars. Not all of us are still as young as we were then. Uh, some of you may be old enough to remember these events yourself from personal experience. One other blurb is from Jeff Patterson, uh, current board member of Veterans for Peace and founder of Courage to Resist. Um, he says, he takes a quote from my reflections in the book, being a revolutionary is like being a midwife for the future. While there's blood and pain, its essence is hope and excitement for a future we can begin to see ahead of us. 
Uh, he says this book makes a compelling case for the inseparability of the movements for an end to unjust war, for the rights of resistors, and for racial and economic justice. So uh, perhaps without further ado, uh, maybe I'll uh, share the screen for just a minute to get used to doing that from time to time. Uh, there are little pieces of the book that I'd like to share with you. The first one is the dedication. This book is dedicated to the movement for Black Lives, whose uh, courage ignited the beginning of genuine change, to About Face, Veterans Against the War, and to the families of all these veterans whose lives were significantly damaged and often cut tragically short by the US war machine and also to all active duty USGIs that they will know they have wholehearted support as they learn the truth, and also to the new generation that is deciding to take over. Uh, let me unshare, let me see, yeah, stop sharing. So uh, if I may, I would like to go ahead and uh, read the introduction to the book. Is that okay, Tim? Assuming no objection, I'll go for it. The whirlwind begins. The storms we've witnessed recently didn't start in 2020 or 2016. It started decades ago in the 1960s. You could feel the storm brewing. Something was blowing in the wind, but it was a whirlwind. Threats of nuclear catastrophe over Cuba blaring on the TV news then police dogs and rednecks terrorizing civil rights marchers down south, then Vietnamese children fleeing from napalm fl flames, then draft notices to go to Vietnam to fight commies. I only heard Bob Dylan's The Times They Are a Change and vaguely at first. I was a small town boy from Eastern Oregon. In my high school modern problems class in 1964, I voted in a straw poll for the right winger Goldwater against the peace candidate Johnson. Uh, together with Bombs Away, Curtis LeMay, Goldwater proposed nuking Vietnam back to the Stone Age. Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush both were Goldwater's friends and strong supporters. Lyndon Johnson defeated Goldwater in 1964, running as a peace candidate. The next year at college in San Francisco, Word spread that LBJ was sending half a million troops to Vietnam. I heard friends talk of conscientious objection or refusing the draft. Some asked me what I planned to do. I couldn't answer. I didn't know. There were also reports in the school paper of students going south to join Freedom Riders in Mississippi to help with voter registration. The quadrangle on the San Francisco State College campus buzzed every day with learning opportunities. Anti-war students organized teach-ins on the war. The Black Students Union had speakers there nearly every day. They said the draft was based on class and race privilege. Working class boys, especially Black ones, got drafted, while middle class boys, especially white ones, got student deferments. They said the whole war was racist. One friend was applying for conscientious objector status. Another was already planning to head for Canada. The spring 1967 mobilization against the war marched past my apartment complex facing the Golden Gate Park panhandle in San Francisco. As I sat there watching from the low slung fence in front of my apartment building, which faced the park, a classmate waved and beckoned me to join. That's all it took after all I had been learning. I literally jumped off the fence and began marching. It was my first anti-war protest, one of many. Not long after that, I was collecting signatures on campus by the dozens for the newly formed Peace and Freedom Party. PFP has been on the ballot ever since. I felt my, I felt my life changing fast. Uh, when I jumped off the fence and joined the protest, I made a decision by the fall I submitted an application for conscientious objector status. It was my first act of war resistance. My small town draft board told me they wouldn't consider it while I had a student deferment. What happened next was bizarre. I saw an ad in the Progressive Magazine to join the anti-war presidential campaign of Eugene McCarthy in Wisconsin. The appeal caught me. 
You can help si you can help stop the war. Come to Wisconsin. Help Eugene McCarthy beat Johnson. It got me. I decided to abandon my student deferment, sell my books, and fly there. When I phoned home from Madison, Wisconsin in January 68 to tell my parents I had left college to try and end the war, my mother said she hoped I would not get in trouble with the government. I told her the government had already gotten in trouble with me. In August 1968, I participated in the Battle of Chicago. Not the last time I was there, but I was there at the Democratic National Convention, not as a frontliner, really more of an observer. The cops message was clear. Standing against the war would get your head beat. After the Chicago may mayhem, I caught a ride to Toronto, Canada, aware it would take a long time to stop the war machine. I wrote home to tell my parents I was in Canada. Four years later, I wrote again to say charges against me for refusing the draft had been dismissed on a technicality. I returned to the US briefly that year to build support for a true amnesty for war resistors of all kinds. Then I went back to Canada to continue working with Amex Canada, the American exile and expatriate war resistor group and magazine that led the amnesty movement from 1972 to 77. All of this was a prelude for me. During the most intense anti-war protests here in the USA from 1969 to 71, I was out of the country. But after the draft refusal charges against me were dismissed in early 1972, I became a leader of the fight for amnesty. It was a years long slog, as Steve Shirley remembers, with intensive organizing among exiled war resistors in Canada, Sweden, France, and England, alliance development with anti-war Vietnam veterans, constant media work, as well as national speaking tours and meetings to develop a winning coalition for amnesty. There were some magic moments like the live national TV nomination of a war resistor for vice president at the 1976 National Democratic Convention and surfacing both uh, Steve Grossman and military resistor Jerry Condon at a Washington, Jerry we surfaced at a Washington DC conference despite the fact he had been court-martialed and carried a 10 year prison sentence. Over those years, we won much of what we had demanded, and the experiences of that time helped shape my commitment to change. I should add, we didn't win at all. Uh, Jerry Condon continues to fight for the rights of veterans to this day, the largest number of people who needed amnesty, half a million bad paper uh, vets. Visiting countries where revolutions were actually happening Portugal during the Carnation Revolution of 1974 to 75, and Sandinista Nicaragua during the 1980s, gave me insight into real revolutions and the fact that the US government would always put them down, whatever it took. Now there's a battle for a Green New Deal to save the planet. In 2020, street protests raged in, in cities across the country and the world to say Black Lives Matter. The official US response to the coronavirus pandemic caused hundreds of thousands of deaths and brought on the worst depression since the 1930s. What's the connection among all these things? They're all part of reclaim, reclaiming a peaceful, just and sustainable planet and our lives. I jumped into the whirlwind more than 50 years ago, hoping and expecting change to come quickly and easily. Now I know better, but the change is coming. There's a hurricane outside. It's early to say how long it will last or what it will bring. My hope is it will stimulate us not merely to save the planet, but to help the people of the USA and the world escape from capitalist never never land and bring about a world we can believe in. Uh, 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 yeah. So that's the introduction. And uh, if you didn't read anything else, you'd get a fairly good sense of what the book is about from that. Um, I would like to um, flash to a, a, a beginning section of my new life in Canada. Uh, the Detroit-Windsor Tunnel was my departure point in August of 1968. 
I hitched a ride with a friend after the convention meltdown in Chicago, leaving Mayor Daley and his head bashing cops behind. Driving from Chicago, following that meltdown, uh, we got to Detroit and entered the tunnel. Uh, it felt appropriate as an exit from my life in the USA to a new life in Canada. As I left the USA behind, my mind buzzed with the question, what lay ahead for me? What would I do? Who would help me? My friend dropped me in the town of Hamilton, northwest uh, of Niagara Falls and continued on to Rochester. I bought a one-way ticket to Toronto on a Grey Coach Lines bus, Canada's version of Greyhound. The bus pulled into Toronto in the early morning. I knew no one there and had less than $100 to my name, all of it in my pocket. I found a phone book and looked up draft resistance. Sure enough, there was a number to call. Yeah. I dialed the number and heard a sympathetic voice tell me how to get to a counseling center on the subway. By mid-morning, I was sitting with a counselor in the office of the Toronto Anti-Draft Program, TADP who gave me a copy of their manual for draft age immigrants to Canada and told me I would probably qualify to become a legal immigrant to Canada if I could get a job offer. Meanwhile, he sent me to an emergency hostel for new arrivals and said he would try to place me in the home of supporters who would help me. They were really organized. The hostel was a little depressing. New arrivals were a bit dazed and uncertain. My main problem was hunger. I noticed there was a nice big kitchen with lots of utensils, but no food. So I asked where I could go to get some food and was directed to a nearby shopping area with dozens of small shops, each specializing in fruit and vegetables, meats, fish, and so on. I brought back enough food uh, to feed myself and a few others and cooked up a meal. That seemed to help the general mood a bit. The next day, TADP called to say I had a place to stay with the University of Toronto professor and his family. I was beginning to like TADP quite a lot and enjoyed reading their manual for draft age immigrants to Canada, a professionally produced and very friendly guide created by fellow resistors uh, uh, in the two previous years. That manual, I should say, became uh, a bestseller with over 65,000 copies in print uh, during the late 60s. Uh, our numbers were growing and support was strong, thanks to a large Canadian anti-war movement. I was one of uh, uh, well over 50,000 uh, uh, resistors who went to Canada. Uh, there's a the actual number is hard to say because quite a number of military resistors uh, went to Canada at that time, but were not able to make it for a variety of reasons that are delved into deeply in my book, which I hope you'll get. Uh, um, should I continue here? I think I'm going to skip from here to another section just because otherwise I'll miss so much. And I'd like to give you a flavor uh, for uh, for as much of this as I can in the, in the limited time. I'll go to the reflections at the, at the start of, uh, at the end of this chapter. My decision to refuse the draft and leave the USA for Canada was life-changing and formative. It was the beginning of a life quest that has been never ending. Instead of pursuing a normal career, I have dedicated most of my life to constant efforts to learn about and change the world. In the process, I missed out on some aspects of a normal life, opting instead for a variety of adventures which were all in pursuit of the elusive goal of change. There have been few shining moments and numerous unfortunate setbacks, but the quest continues. Along the way, I have sustained a sense of revolutionary optimism that I'm part of a widening and deepening stream of expanded consciousness about new and better possibilities. I think a long view helps. Back in the 60s and 70s, there was a sense of urgency about change, followed by frustrations at shortcomings and setbacks. But the amazing success of our struggle for amnesty, together with the defeat of Nixon back in 74, uh, when he was forced to resign in disgrace, have served as examples and reminders for me that change is possible and that solidarity and perseverance can lead to encouraging breakthroughs. 
This fostered over-optimism following the exhilarating triumph of Vietnam's liberation forces in 1975. I started to believe in the discredited domino theory and looked for a steady succession of new anti-imperialist victories around the world and to a long springtime of progressive thinking at home. So the tidal wave of post-Vietnam reaction ushered in by Ronald Reagan in 1980, which has raged unabated ever since, caught me by surprise. Reagan dedicated his presidency to overcoming the Vietnam syndrome, a widespread reluctance among people in the USA to engage in more Vietnam-style interventionist adventures. I have never ceased to be optimistic, and I stubbornly continue to believe that the force of solidarity and struggle is the force of life itself and that it will prevail. The resurgence of struggle, both in the streets and the ballot box brought on by Bernie Sanders, AOC, and the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and related depression feels to me like springtime after a long winter. We're enjoying the first shoots of spring here in New York City right now, and so it feels familiar. Let me just switch to uh, uh, the start of our campaign for universal unconditional amnesty. Um, it should, that, let me just, let's see, I'll, can I share my screen? Let's just see. Forgive me, uh, I can do this. I'll share a couple of things. At this, our first, our main, our main issue of Amex Canada uh, on amnesty was called Amnesty in the War, and it was published in March of 1972. Uh, it says here it should it should not have been difficult to figure out the amnesty issue, but it was. Part of the problem was emotional, another was social, and the political part was complicated. Emotionally, we were so angry at the United States government that it was repugnant to ask for anything. Socially, we were concerned about alienating our friends who felt as we all did about it. And many resistors worried that a campaign for amnesty would offend Canadians who had welcomed us. Politically, we came to know amnesty was right, but we had to find a way to say it. I, I'm gonna stop sharing, but first I wanted to show you this picture of our first uh, uh, press conference in Canada for amnesty. I know I look different and that most of us look different at that time, but uh, this was a press conference in January of 1972 of uh, American war resistors uh, rejecting alternative service and uh, calling for what we called a uh, full restoration of civil liberties with no conditions. Uh, I will stop sharing the screen here. Uh, I'll come back and share it again sometimes, but uh, I could have spent time telling you about all those people. It's good to acknowledge uh, uh, at least one of them. Uh, Steve and my friend uh, Jack Calhoun uh, is there. He was uh, a co-editor with us of Amex and um, as a doctoral student in US history, a major source of uh, uh, research and, and clarification of what we could try for and expect to get with amnesty. Uh, so just to go on with what I was say, reading before, how could we say, how could we demand amnesty from a, a cabal of war criminals? How could we say to people we felt should be in jail that they should not prosecute us? In a way, it was an example of applied dialectical materialism, an understanding that things do change. The losers now would indeed be later to win, as Bob Dylan had sung in the times they were changing. That thought made it easier to figure out. We did not need to ask for anything, even if the liberal politicians tried to make it seem that way. There was a gulf between them and us. We were proud of our resistance and defiant about claiming the rightness of our position. We weren't asking uh, for favors or forgiveness. We were asking for, that is to say, demanding universal and unconditional amnesty. Most important was the universal part. Liberal politicians hoped they could forgive draft resistors while leaving military resistors and veterans to the military 
and completely forgetting about other anti-war activists who were either in jail or subject to prosecution. We refused to see any differences based on timing or intensity of opposition. The war was the crime. Resistance was right and necessary. No punishment could be considered acceptable. Uh, I can remember Steve and I talking about how we could get this across. At one point, uh, came up with a slogan, amnesty for the future, not just the past. We were trying to win the right to resist unjust war. Interestingly, we found a mood in the media that was surprisingly open to us. The anti-war movement had uh, held high political ground at that moment. Hundreds of thousands of people had mobilized and marched all across the USA and the world. Draft boards had been flooded with CO applications. Judges were dismissing draft cases by the dozens. My own case was dismissed on a technicality in the spring of 1972. Nixon actually ended the draft in 1971. I guess he just felt that he, he, he was given a war and nobody wanted to go. In 1970, Marine Colonel Robert Heinel published an article saying the US military was breaking down in Vietnam. Soldiers were refusing to fight. Junior officers and gung-ho sergeants were being fragged. Fragmentation grenades rolled into their tents at night. Bluntly stated, the US was losing the war. The Vietnamese liberation forces were winning. I ain't marching anymore had become we don't want your effing war. So that, is kind of a taste. Let me jump again, because uh, I really want to focus uh, on what we used to call bad paper vets, who were quite uh, literally the majority of people we felt needed amnesty. There were more than half a million of them from the Vietnam era. The bad charges piled on top of post-Vietnam stress syndrome, later designated as post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. Now a lost generation of Vietnam era veterans lives a permanent nightmare, mass unemployment, homelessness, mental illness, prison, and suicide at epidemic proportions. A 2016 VA report said that out of 55 million veterans from 1979 to 2014, an average of 20 veterans a day have died from suicide. That computes to more than a quarter million suicides during that period, an estimated total of between 150,000 and, and 200,000 Vietnam veteran suicides makes about triple the official number of US combat deaths in Vietnam. Meanwhile, in, by two, 1988, more than half of a million, I'm sorry, more than half of all Vietnam veterans diagnosed with PTSD, P PTSD reported that they had been arrested, more than a third of them multiple times. In 1985, more than one in five prison inmates in the US was a veteran. What was their crime? Was PTSD a crime? More to the point, what was their life like? Constant nightmarish flashbacks, often causing uh, violent reactions and broken homes leading to life on the streets have made Vietnam veterans permanent war victims. This was the background as we launched our amnesty campaign. Uh, I would like also to uh, share uh, some of the help we got. As we started our campaign, we looked for people with experience to advise us. And uh, we met uh, uh, the founders of the Southern Conference Education Fund, uh, Carl Braden and Ann Braden and uh, uh, Virginia Collins, the uh, Vice President of the Republic of New Africa and mother of Walter Collins. Uh, she, uh, Virginia and Walter were conducting a national amnesty speaking tour on behalf of Virginia's son, Walter. He had already spent 16 months of five concurrent five-year maximum sentences in federal prison for draft resistance. Not just a draft resistor, Walter was also the regional director of the National Association of Black Students and a founder of the National Black Draft Counselors. He had been working on a PhD thesis at the University of Michigan when his draft board canceled his student deferment and classified him 1A. It was like uh, a punishment for 
uh, daring to counsel others to refuse the draft. Within two weeks of reclassification, the draft board ordered Walter's induction. He fought it, refusing induction five times, but the draft board was de determined to stop him. At the age of 27, he was a veteran civil rights organizer. He had participated in the 1963 sit-ins to desegregate lunch counters and theaters in New Orleans and had helped register voters in Louisiana and Mississippi in the 1964 Mississippi Freedom Summer Project. Beyond that, as a SCEF organizer, he had helped form a Black-White Alliance of Workers in the Masonite Corporation in Laurel, Mississippi. According to Carl Brayton, who, so, who told the story as part of the national speaking tour, Walter's work led to a successful woodcutter's strike. Uh, Brayden said this, the strike's black-white unity was in large part due to the work of Walter Collins. I can say that both Walter and his mom became board members of uh, the newly founded National, Co National Council for Universal and Unconditional Amnesty. Um, we invited Carl to come to Toronto and give us a be the benefit of their experience. Uh, uh, he, he explained how we could build an effective campaign for amnesty, highlighting all the political issues. He also sat down with me personally to talk about his life as an organizer. It was a powerful inspiration for me, and I include it here for that reason. Carl and his wife, Anne, had devoted their lives to fighting racism. In 1954, they bought a home in an all-white neighborhood uh, in Louisville and then deeded it to an African-American family. The Ku Klux Klan responded by stoning and firing shots at the house, burning a cross in front of it and then setting off explosives under it, driving the family out and destroying the home. Both Carl and Anne were charged with sedition, since working for racial integration at that time was generally considered communist subversion. The Klan terrorists were not charged. Carl was convicted and sentenced to 15 years in prison. He served seven months of his sentence before he was released on bond, a pending appeal. His conviction was then overturned, so he got out and continued organizing. And uh, part of that was he, he actually, he and, and Virginia were successful in getting Walter out of jail. Um, I, I uh, both Carl and his mother, I told you, became original board members of uh, National Council for Universal and Conditional Amnesty later that year. Uh, what I learned from Walter was invaluable since I had never really experienced the epic struggles against racism and segregation that had defined his and his mother's lives. He was among the first to show me that resisting the draft was part of a vastly deeper struggle. Uh, while the Black Students Union at San Francisco State College had made me understand the draft as part of a system that protects privileges of class and race, Walter's life work as a founding organizer of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, and all the rest showed a quiet determination that was genuinely fierce and implacable. We had a talk at one point that hit me hard. He stated bluntly that no white person in America could be free of racism. He made it clear that this was true regardless of what I or any other white person might think or feel. Painful and troubling as it was to hear, I had to accept it knowing that in my case, at least, growing up blind to the prejudice and systemic racism that was as common as air elsewhere had left me unaware of most of what Walter was trying to tell me. It was a relief to know he was telling me this to help open my eyes and heart so I would be better able to fight and organize for change. Maybe I could get to the level of Carl Braden after a lifetime or two of tireless organizing. Walter died of cancer in 1995. Um, I want to jump again uh, to, um, I want to jump to Paris. Uh, after, uh, after the Christmas bombing of 1972, uh, uh, Nixon and Kissinger switched gears and signed the peace accord uh, to end the war in January 1973, which served as a point of departure for really uh, 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 
an international conference of war resistors for amnesty, which we called for Paris uh, right after January 27th of that year. As it turned out, shortly after our delegation from Canada landed in Paris, we learned that Nixon had pressured French President Georges Pompidou into banning the conference. And uh, so we were stuck in Paris, but we had uh, a tremendous opportunity to meet up with exiles from Sweden, France, and Great Britain, as well as some GIs from resistance in the army in West, uh, German, West Germany, as well as delegates from the Vietnam veterans against the war. We also had an opportunity to meet famous French philosopher, Jean-Paul Sartre, uh, who uh, was uh, gracious enough to meet with us and then write an open letter uh, to President Nixon calling for amnesty. Um, he said, I'm writing to you from France. I know that the question of granting or not granting amnesty to deserters and draft resistors of the Vietnam War deeply divides your country. You may feel that this conflict is an internal matter concerning the, the United States and thus does not regard Europeans. However, since this problem is a sequel of a war waged for many years against a foreign country, it seems to me that any foreign country has the right to give its viewpoint. As for me, in my capacity as president of the Russell Tribunal, which found the American government guilty of numerous war crimes and genocide in Vietnam, I shall try to convey the viewpoint of the majority of Europeans. And he went on to write that uh, uh, Nixon uh, or the US government should grant uh, a full universal and unconditional amnesty. It was a wonderful opportunity to win the support of a truly great person. Um, let me jump again uh, to uh, a section in which we uh, are working with what we called winter soldiers. Um, George Washington's famous comparison of sunshine patriots and winter soldiers got an echo from the Vietnam veterans against the war who organized a series of high visibility actions around this theme. They hammered away at Nixon as a sunshine patriot and made it clear that their anti-war fight was the true expression of patriotism. We shared that with them. And in the spring of 1974, Amex helped VVAW get an, an INCUA steering committee seat. And we worked very, very closely together for uh, universal unconditional amnesty. Um, they were absolutely instrumental in uh, making that uh, demand stick within that coalition of various uh, groupings. And as uh, uh, my partner and I uh, got ready to uh, move back to the US uh, in August of 74, they were instrumental. Our first stop actually was uh, a July 4th uh, demonstration in Washington organized by Vietnam veterans against the war, calling for the end of the war, uh, Nixon's resignation, and full amnesty. Uh, at that time, you may remember Nixon uh, uh, was forced to resign because of the Watergate scandal in August of 1974. And the first thing that uh, that happened after that was he was immediately pardoned as a first act by former president, vice, uh, former vice president Ford, who then tried to cover himself by extending clemency to draft resistors, but not military resistors or uh, uh, militant anti-war activists. The stark contrast between Ford's, Ford's pardoning Nixon and offering a punitive conditional clemency to draft resistors served to unify us in a boycott of that unjust program. Uh, we convened an international conference of exiled American war resistors in September 74 in Toronto. Representatives from Sweden, France, and Great Britain joined others from across Canada, as well as uh, uh, Vietnam veterans and other supporters from the States, all united in a call for a boycott of that Ford clemency program. Um, we got strong endorsements from our supporters in the US, plus a flood of positive media coverage. 
two of our leaders, Steve Grossman and Jerry Condon, agreed to undertake speaking tours in the U.S., gambling that we could generate enough visibility and support for them that U.S. authorities would not arrest them. It was a sign of the times. The tactic was successful. Steve was facing charges of draft resistance and could have been seized and thrown in jail at any time. But he and his partner, <laughs> Steve and his partner Evangeline Mix toured numerous cities and college campuses in the Midwest, including an amnesty conference in Louisville, Kentucky. The results were massive public, positive publicity and a groundswell of support, after which they returned safely to Toronto. Gary Campbell was a bit riskier. He had already been convicted in absentia by an army court martial for desertion after leaving Fort Bragg years earlier. So he, had already, he already had a 10 year sentence hanging over his head. With all this in mind, we planned and prepared his return with great care. He and his partner, Sandy Rutherford, would surface in Washington, D.C as guests of honor at a large Americans for Amnesty conference co-hosted by former Attorney General Ramsey Clark and Gold Star Mother Louise Ransom. Getting them there was half the fun. I had the job of coordinating their travel from Toronto to New York where we met clandestinely in a Greenwich Village coffee house, Cafe Reggio. They then traveled by train to DC to a tremendous reception and lots of live TV coverage. It was the kickoff of a national campaign. After the conference, they flew to Los Angeles and conducted a nonstop West Coast speaking tour. In fact, Jerry just kept touring. And about nine months later, he received a bad conduct discharge from the army in the mail. My impression from then on was that Jerry's tour never really ended. He had transformed himself into a national organizer of anti-war veterans. He has been a leader of Veterans for Peace for many, many years um, and still is among the most active uh, anti-war veterans. Uh, let me just see, ah, yes, I want to uh, uh, fast forward from there to uh, our participation in the 1976 uh, uh, electoral campaign. We, uh, uh, we worked together with uh, Vietnam Veterans Against the War, Clergy and Laity Concerned, Indochina Peace and Friendship Caravans, going, sending people all across the country, building support for amnesty during the, uh, uh, the election campaigns of 1976. And one of uh, uh, a draft resistor from uh, London actually got himself nominated as an alternate delegate to the Democratic National Convention that was slated for New York City in August of 1976. Um, we decided that we would work with him to get him nominated for vice president. Uh, something of a crazy idea. Uh, and of course, it involved some organizing. First, we had to fight for Fritz, Fritz to be allowed to attend the convention, despite being indicted as a draft resistor. Then we had to build enough visibility on his arrival to keep him from being grabbed and swept far away from the convention. I was charged with media coordination, uh, which I developed a knack for over the years. So when Fritz arrived at Kennedy Airport, he was met by a huge press conference and a spirited crowd of supporters. Even though federal marshals did grab him, our volunteer attorneys managed to convince a federal magistrate in Brooklyn to let him attend the convention and deal with the charges afterwards. We then put together a solid core of seasoned amnesty movement organizers to work the convention. An Amex crew composed of Steve and Jerry and myself joined the INCUA staff plus members of clergy and lady concerned, the Greenwich Village Independent Democrats Am Amnesty Committee, Gold Star Parents for Amnesty and others. We set out to prove what a small group of dedicated organizers can do. We uh, spent the next uh, three days uh, 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 on the floor of the convention, getting petition signatures from 582 signers uh, calling for a 20 minute discussion of amnesty in the open convention. 
Nevertheless, the Carter uh, organization shut us down. So we turned around, said, no problem. We'll uh, go back and, and get the signatures to have Fritz nominated for vice president. They could have stopped us, but they realized we had them beat. And so uh, we went ahead and planned for Fritz's nomination. It was thanks to Steve Grossman with his background in theater that we came up with uh, uh, something that turned out uh, pretty amazing. First came Gold Star Mother Louise Ransom, then Vietnam veteran Ron Kovic, confined to a wheelchair due to paralysis from the, the chest down. The effect was stupendous, enough that uh, it became part of Oliver Stone's Born on the Fourth of July uh, in a movie that came out, I believe, in 1980. Louise started out saying, my credentials for addressing this convention have been earned in the hardest possible way. My oldest son was killed in Vietnam on Mother's Day, 1968. The only way we can give meaning to the lives of our sons and, our sons and to guarantee that their deaths shall not have been for nothing is to demonstrate that we have learned something from them and ensure that never again will there be another Vietnam. Total amnesty would be a fitting memorial to the sacrifice of my son. Therefore, with pride, I put into nomination the name of exiled war resistor Fritz E. Fa. The crowd rose to its feet in applause, many with tears in their eyes. Then, when Ron Kovic was wheeled to the podium, the crowd fell silent. I am the living death, your Memorial Day on wheels. Your Yankee Doodle Dandy, your John Wayne come home, your 4th of July firecracker exploding in the graves. Kovic's words pierced the silence, cutting through the convention's bombastic rhetoric with some of the bitter truth of the Vietnam War. He told how his childhood patriotism was changed forever by his experience in Vietnam, accidentally killing one of his own men, shooting a group of innocent Vietnamese civilians, including two small children, and being shot himself and paralyzed for life. He spoke of enlisting in the Marines and going to Vietnam for two tours of duty and turning against the war and later speaking out wherever people would listen to me. He concluded, I have the proud distinction of nominating Fritz Ifa for Vice President of the United States. Welcome home, Fritz. <laughs> so Fritz Ifa, the draft resistor from England, came to the podium uh, to a standing ovation. And uh, uh, as, as our supporters wound, wound through the crowd with banners saying universal unconditional amnesty, veterans need amnesty too, totally am, total amnesty now. Friends spoke eloquently about the fact that it wasn't just people like him, draft resistors who needed amnesty, but uh, all the various types of uh, uh, resistors, especially military resistors, veterans without uh, with uh, bad conduct discharges and civilian anti-war protesters, some of whom were still in jail. Uh, and uh, at the end, he said, I'm proud to come to this convention to represent war resistors. The risk involved in coming before you was certainly worth taking. I respectfully decline nomination for vice president of the United States, blah, blah, blah. It was really quite an event. Uh, I, I would like to add that uh, the result uh, was that Carter did indeed uh, 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 change his position and agree to uh, what was not everything that we wanted, but quite a bit. Um, and of course, uh, uh, what he obviously did not want to do was include military resistors and veterans, and we had to pressure him. I can tell you that uh, uh, many of our liberal anti-war supporters wanted to give Carter the benefit of the doubt and settle for what, whatever he might give. The Amex hardcore thought otherwise. The Carter organization had invited Amex to submit a position paper on amnesty before the convention. A friendly contact at the Carter staff counseled us to trust Carter, but. Uh, because once he was elected, his amnesty program would amount to just about what we wanted, though it wouldn't look or sound like universal and unconditional amnesty. Well, uh, Steve and, and Jack 
uh, made sure that they knew exactly what we needed and we assured them that we would continue building support for it. Um, and um, uh, uh, the National Council was able to arrange an amnesty delegation meeting with uh, Carter's longtime associate, Charles Kerbo, a conservative Georgian and senior partner in one of the South's most powerful law firms. Uh, one of his main concerns was that if vets with bad papers had them upgraded to general or honorable, they would be eligible for veterans benefits. He also expressed worry that a Carter amnesty might jeopardize U.S. ability to raise a conscript army in the future. This, of course, was always one of our goals in the fight for amnesty. Our key message had always asserted the right to resist unjust wars of aggression. So there's, there's, uh, a bit more that we could uh, go uh, go into. I can just say that uh, uh, we were in a situation where we knew that we were going to have to uh, continue to be visible and vocal uh, and do whatever we could to uh, pressure Carter. I proposed a massive border crossing by a crowd of exiled draft resistors and deserters together with anti-war vets and civilians to precede the pardon announcement and defy Washington to make arrests. We didn't do that. It would have been too expensive, but we did end up organizing uh, uh, what we called uh, Black Eye Conference for Amnesty immediately following um, uh, uh, Carter's announcement. We announced the International Conference of War Resisters and, and Veterans for January 29th and 30th, 1977. Uh, and uh, uh, it turned out to be perfect. Uh, a, a week after the White House announcement of the Carter pardon on January 21st, 77, Carter's first full day in office. The media described the initial Amex response as a bitter disappointment uh, as bitter disappointment at Carter's unconditional pardon for draft resistors and non-registrants, which excluded military deserters or AWOLs, uh, other veterans with less than honorable discharges and civilians with anti-war charges or convictions. Uh, the, the administration did promise a special Pentagon study to make recommendations concerning deserters and some bad paper vets. We blasted the Carter pardon as thoroughly discriminatory on the basis of class and race for including mainly white middle-class draft resistors, but excluding poor white and minority forms of war resistance. Uh, the, port, the pardon really seemed to us like a trick. Apparently Carter, Carter didn't feel secure enough politically to deal with military deserters and was stalling for time to arrange some sort of negotiating decision. I can tell you, uh, we ended up continuing our campaign. Ultimately, we were able to uh, push for more. It took months of work. Uh, uh, one of the slogans of the Toronto conferences, conference was on to Washington. During the first 10 days of February, right after our conference, the amnesty movement actually did move on to Washington, D.C. for a series of veteran-oriented amnesty actions and an appeal for reconciliation conference sponsored by the American Friends Service Committee. We turned in uh, about 80,000 signatures uh, from the appeal uh, demanding uh, amnesty as well as uh, uh, genuine enforcement of the uh, peace agreement from 1973. We had our work cut out for us at that time, and I can tell you that the the uh, leadership of uh, the uh, Am Amex leadership in Toronto was absolutely swamped. Uh, they had to continue uh, reaching out to deserters to help them navigate the uh, bureaucratic processing that Carter finally came up with that got them back, uh, not with a complete amnesty, but with, uh, uh, in general, general discharge as opposed to um, the, the worst discharges that they would have got. Uh, and we continued uh, our campaign. And as I said, 
Jerry uh, has continued campaigning along with uh, Veterans for Peace to this very day. So that's as much as I want to say about our campaign for amnesty. I know I have skipped over a few things uh, because there's just so much. And once again, I want to let you know that you can get the details uh, uh, in the book. Uh, I would like to switch briefly to um, give a couple of highlights. Let's see. Thank you. Switch to just highlight my uh, time in Nicaragua very, very briefly. One of the first things I saw when I got there was this poster uh, of Eugene Hassenfuss, who was a former Marine who had been flying uh, 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 supplies to the Contras. Uh, they knocked him down. This, the Sandinista made a big deal of, of it and put up this poster that says, more than a battalion of yours, blonde invader, will bite the dust in our rugged mountains. Uh, the Sandinista government then proceeded to pardon Hessenfuss uh, in December of 1986. I went to uh, Nicaragua in 1987 to help the Sandinista revolution as part of Technica, uh, a group of North Americans who offered technical skills to bolster the young revolution as a worker expert in computer-based publishing, also known as desktop publishing. I helped upgrade the Sandinista national newspaper Barricada using personal computers, laser printers, and plain paper all read, readily available on the world market, uh, sidestepping the US effort to strangle the revolution. There's a lot of things that I could um, tell about. I just wanna say it was a wonderful opportunity for me and a fabulous experience. For three years, I lived and worked with Sandinistas and ordinary Nicaraguans while witnessing the revolutionary process. Despite grinding poverty amidst the Contra War, uh, and the Nikas harnessed the Nikas hardened their tenacity and alegria, ingrained love of life. For me, it was a chance to see and be part of a genuine revolution, even including participation in neighborhood militia. Uh, now, I don't know how I'm doing for time. It seems to me that I've probably been uh, reading or speaking for about 40 minutes. Is that true? That's correct. Okay. If you'd like to continue on a little bit, please do so. Well, thank you. Okay, I, thanks for that reassurance. I'm, I, I, uh, there's a couple of funny pieces and a little bit more inspiring stuff, and I'll go ahead for a little while longer and then give a chance for discussion. It says here, the closest thing I came to armed struggle was jamming an antique M1 rifle during an evening militia practice. While on guard, we heard noise that turned out to be a mix of family feud and drunken brawl. My other warlike experience was the loud bang of mangoes falling on our zinc roof. The first time I heard it, I thought the war had finally landed in Managua. I also traveled up to the mountains where the Sandinista guerrillas had built their revolutionary bases. But by the time I got there in 1987, the purpose was to celebrate earlier victories. That was beautiful enough. And my host made it sort of real by stowing me in the back of a troop truck where I fell asleep, giving them the chance to scare me awake with a fake emergency. I wasn't exactly Che Guevara. There's lots more I could uh, say about the Sandinista revolution. One of the things that happened, um, uh, well, ordinary life in Nicaragua was an education in itself. As part of the volunteer staff at the newspaper, I received the same weekly rations of rice and beans as everyone else. It was a great opportunity to slim down while developing a taste for local herbs and spices. Another internationalist friend of, and I pooled resources to buy a Honda 50 motorbike, which I used to get to the local market and shop for the local, with the local people. Unfortunately, my friend John Files lost his life on the motorbike in a highway accident a few months after we bought it. The tragedy moved the Barricada editors and staff to reach out to John's mother with condolences and emotional support. 
John was from Canada. His friends were there, founded a John Files Brigade to carry on solidarity with Nicaragua in his name. It was a reminder of Ben Linder, the young University of Washington engineer who was killed by Contras while constructing a hydroelectric micro dam in the mountains of Hinotega, close to where Sandinista guerrillas had first fought. After Ben's murder, President Daniel Ortega shouldered his coffin in a procession after speaking at his funeral. The guest house where I stayed in uh, first when I went to Managua with, Nica, with Technica was named the Bentlinder House. As I said, there's much more I could say about this, but I think I would like to fast forward again to 2011 and tell a little bit about things that happened um, once back in the uh, back in the states and in the thick of things here. Uh, I want to share my experience with the South Bronx Community Congress during the Obama years. As a coalition of tenant organizers, unionists, and other community groups, we held annual people's assemblies at Hostos Community College in the South Bronx. On the agenda were struggles against workplace racism, marches against poverty and violence, and jobs, and for jobs. We also launched a campaign to save 17 Bronx post offices from threatened closings. In 2011, um, these campaigns. I didn't hear that. In 2011, these campaigns merged with a Hello, city. Hello, Oscar Ross Mastu. Okay, so these campaigns merged with a citywide movement against anti people budget cuts in New York. In March of that year, thousands marched from City Hall to Wall Street and back. A week later, a thousand workers occupied the state capitol in Albany. In May, there was a massive march organized by the teachers union and its allies. In mid-June, the New York City Public Workers Union mobilized thousands of public sector workers. The next day, the New York City Building Trades Council staged a giant protest of uh, construction workers. This was the first large labor march in decades to break through police barricades intended to hem them in and blunt their message. Then came Bloombergville, an encampment near New York City's City Hall, a massive sit-in lasting several weeks to protest uh, Mayor Bloomberg's austerity budget. It was inspired by gigantic occupations of public squares in Egypt, Tunisia, Spain, Greece, and Wisconsin. And these mobilizations in turn stimulated Occupy Wall Street, an outpouring of the 99% that lasted for weeks and spread across the country. Apparently leaderless, the mobilization inspired copycat occupations in cities across the country and beyond borders. On the West Coast, the Longshore Workers Union joined hands with Occupy and shut down ports from San Diego to uh, Vancouver, BC. Uh, this kind of popular explosion burst across the country again in the spring of 2020 stronger than ever in the wake of police murders of black, uh, black people. The question arises, how will this type of popular power replace the existing official structures? It can happen, and I think it will happen. I want to uh, just jump again from there, really, to, I think, uh, the last piece uh, that I'll read tonight. There's more, but I know I've taken time, and I hope I don't uh, wear out my welcome. I just want to, there's a chapter, chapter 14 in the book called Messages from the Future. Uh, let me just uh, show you a couple of things there. Oops. How could things turn out if the Green New Deal were to succeed? To help imagine it, in mid-April 2019, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez teamed up with Naomi Klein and illustrator Molly Crabapple uh, to present a futuristic car cartoon art video scenario. I don't know if you can see this well. It talks about the decade of the New Deal. Uh, and uh, uh, it says, uh, 
leave no one behind. They realized, Naomi Klein wrote, that the biggest obstacle to the kind of transformative change the Green New Deal envisions is overcoming the skepticism that humanity could ever pull off something at this scale and speed. The idea that societies could collectively decide to embrace rapid foundational changes to transportation, housing, energy, agriculture, forestry, and more, precisely what is needed to avert climate breakdown, is not something for which most of us have any living reference. We have grown up bombarded with the message that there is no alternative to the crappy system that is destabilizing the planet and hoarding vast wealth at the top. AOC says the first big step is just closing our eyes and imagining. It. We can be whatever we have the courage to see, adding that the Green New Deal is our plan for a future worth fighting for. It reminds me of another message from the future, John Lennon's Imagine, released in 1988. Imagine all the people sharing all the world. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will live as one. And here's the message, change everything. What if we imagine we can change everything? Imagine no more prisons. It isn't hard to do. Imagine all the people living life in peace. Imagine free medical care, free 24-hour child care, free tuition for as long as you want to study, free transportation, free time, like somewhere from West Side Story. Imagine good housing for everyone. I'm going to stop there. There's so much more, but it's as good a place to stop as I can think of. And I hope I haven't uh, taken too much time, and I look forward to any uh, discussion that might arise. Thanks for your patience. Okay, it's now time to unmute and ask our uh, speaker questions. I'm going to have the first one. You've pursued a lifetime of um, activism uh, in causes that you like to do. What, as I've often said, what good do you see in the country? Is there anything good about the United States? Well, it was good enough that I really did want to uh, uh, come back, um, I, guess, I guess a little bit like a moth to a flame, uh, but also to the excitement really of ushering in a future that we can believe in. Um, also, you know, when you look at um, the experience of recent years, uh, just taking as a notable example, uh, uh, Bernie's uh, two campaigns for president, trying to uh, win support for a future we can believe in. To me, it's exhilarating to think that we could get there. I know that it, it's um, uh, deeply frustrating that we could come so close and yet still be so far. But if we can do it, we will accomplish something that will indeed change the world. And I get excited by that. I also would like to tell you very honestly that I and my wife, both of us love New York. Uh, we very much wanna be here. Uh, we think that it's possible uh, uh, not only to make history, but to, uh, uh, to make this country a, a better place to be. So. It's something to believe in. Okay, I just was curious because, you know, many a times in this forum, we have a lot of people who will blame our country for every ill in the world and blame us for every everything going on from the CIA to the, um, to the, to the black operations to even starting the war in Ukraine, you know. And I'm going to shut up now. Thank you for your answer. Uh, anybody else have questions, please go ahead and raise your hand. Let me just jump in with a very quick answer on that. We need to bear in mind that we, at a very minimum, have two nations in one. There are actually more than two nations. And um, to some degree, uh, as we know, you know, the country is just uh, crazily polarized. Uh, yes. But... Uh, at the top, you've got the 1%. So 
Because that really is one nation and they kind of think that they're the only nation. Uh, the bottom 99% is another nation. And within that, of course, we have uh, 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 the African-American nation, we have the indigenous nations and we have a, a whole set of others. So it's on the basis of that, that I think that we can really forge a coalition of hope and love for the future. Okay, that, that's fair. I apologize. Sometimes I just get a little uh, sick about hearing about Ibesh in our nation like crazy because I... I... Well, go out and buy a flag. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Charlie. All right, I guess, I guess you're, you're, you're set. All right, questions from the rest of the audience. Please use your hand. It's not Americans, it's just everything you do. Go out and buy a flag. Go out John, and buy a John, Lee, John Lee has her. Can I speak? All right, Jan Lee, go ahead. Kim, I'll ask a follow up question uh, for you in a way. Um, what's, um, what do you think uh, is the best? of the United States? And what do you think is the worst? Um, and um, I guess the third question is, what can we do about it? Well, that's a very challenging question. And I thank you for it. I think that our diversity and uh, the hope of yeah. literally untold millions of people who have uh, come to the United States uh, with hope uh, of opportunity uh, uh, and a better life uh, is the source of constant renewal. It's also the, the source of much heartbreak. My mother, who just celebrated her 100th birthday, was, she was born 100 years ago in Las Cruces, New Mexico. As I like to say, right smack on the border with Mexico. Um, and Sometimes I think that uh, uh, as she was born, part of her was in Mexico and uh, as her head came in uh, to the United States. And, um, you know, we've gone through uh, some really rough times for uh, uh, people from Mexico uh, uh, that was, who were essentially the scapegoats for a, a a battering uh, exercise against all immigrants uh, by uh, Trump and his followers. And that uh, campaign of hatred continues. Uh, and of course, it's been aimed at all immigrants, uh, Muslims, people from Asia, most recently, uh, especially Chinese. So that it's, it's we have uh, an interesting thing where we've got really the richest diversity of any country on the planet. Uh, and a, uh, some of the national leadership wants to think that this rich diversity is somehow a problem. I think it is the best thing in the country. Uh, we live in New York where literally 165 languages are spoken. There are people from everywhere. Uh, I was lucky to work for five years at the United Nations and uh, found it very exhilarating, even though, as we know, um, uh, the US government doesn't really respect the United Nations the way it used to. But I think there's hope and the diversity is uh, uh, one of the main sources of that hope for me. Okay, the way. Okay, uh, I have a question, Tim. Not to team, but the speaker. Speaker. Okay, the thing is, okay. Uh, all right, we have. Uh, ben, right now, one question. Ben, well, we have Raj first, and we have Sam, and then I think Frank wanted to go, and uh, then I'll get you, Dan. Okay. What? So, okay. Yes, all people. All right, so Raj, you got a, you got your hand up. Go ahead and ask your question. Uh, when I listened to you, and I remember at least four young men on a campus had to say them goodbye to going to Vietnam with their tearful eyes. And after the war, I met several written Vietnamese 
return soldiers and i saw their mental conditions in uh, i ran into them various various uh, jobs or, and uh, and uh, hitchhiking and uh, those people those people really paid for america they put their life on line and uh, many must have died so those who I'm, i sent i did not uh, i cannot possibly see because uh, so what what do you tell to them what what do what what do you you are trap dodgers and everything fine and and you are celebrating your it's fine what do i tell to those, those people if i meet them what do i tell 50000 died a million people got hurt what do i tell them i say i say let's celebrate because these people are the brave for protesters and uh, who did not go and trap dodgers what do i say Yes, it is. yes, it's a very, very good question. Uh, the, the way that uh, 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 young people, young soldiers in, in Vietnam were used uh, was an absolute crime and uh, tragedy that continues to the present day. And uh, we need to uh, uh, stand right alongside and with them demand that uh, they be made whole. That there, that the that the uh, the injuries and tragedies they suffered uh, uh, need to uh, have them prioritized for uh, somehow rebuilding their lives instead of continuing to victimize them. And that goes uh, very much the same for the uh, GIs and veterans from the. Uh, uh, from the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. We, we really need to recognize that the, the way to avoid this is to end these wars and to recognize that uh, really uh, since uh, for, for really 75 or 80 years, the US government has been uh, using young lives to wage wars that should not have been waged and they got to make it up to these veterans and they got to stop with the wars and it's our job to make that happen um uh, I'm, I'm sorry Tim. can i ask you a second little question on that you know you know you know my my, pro my problem is that this that we are we are going to have wars and we are having a war after vietnam and uh somebody has to go if we have war well, that's the point. We, we've got to we've got to stop with these wars. I think the the old slogan question, "What if they gave a war and nobody came?" is something. You know, you haven't you know, you know, stopped it for fifty years, sixty, oh, seventy me. years. Stopped it. I'm sorry, I didn't get that last. You time. you didn't know you haven't you've been working all your life and you haven't stopped the wars. We still go, and we still putting up in Ukraine. You know, creating a war. Okay, so I mean, it's not stopping. It's not going to stop. That's our job. I believe that the uh, fundamental task of uh, people here in this country is to stop the war machine. We also have to stop the crazy uh, military budget that's, uh, that gets in the way of solving the problems that we have here at home. One of the things that I feel most uh, encouraged by and proud of from uh, uh, our generation from uh, the Vietnam era was that we really did dedicate ourselves to trying to stop the, the war. And uh, I, I never forget that it was uh, the Vietnamese liberation fighters who actually made the stop happen. But the GIs in Vietnam also did. They, they put down their weapons and stopped fighting. And that was exactly right, in my opinion. And uh, that's why so many of them ended up in stockades. Uh, and of course, literally millions of us uh, went out into the streets, tens, and, tens of thousands of us uh, refused to fight and either went underground or left the country. We basically said no to the war. And I believe that we have to do that again. It does seem uh, like an impossible challenge, even an impossible dream to say that we can stop the war machine. But in fact, we can. 
and that was done uh, in uh, the Vietnam period. We need to do it again. Thank you. I'm done. Sam, you're next. Um, uh, uh, my question is, uh, uh, do you think that uh, with this uh, Ukraine situation, where finally, uh, you know, to be blunt, white people, as the journalists said, relatively civilized, re relatively European peoples, they are uh, seeing what it feels to be under, uh, you know, the wrong end of the gun. Uh, uh, this is something which has not uh, been part of the European experience for generations, and uh, now they are seeing how ugly it is to be under uh, the boot of a country which thinks it should uh, decide how people in your borders live lives. Uh, I'm hoping that this will uh, basically discredit it to a greater extent, not entirely, unfortunately, but uh, to a larger extent, people will uh, recoil from any uh, meddling by these so-called great powers in the affairs of uh, lesser nations, something which uh, putatively should have happened uh, during World War I when the UK claimed it was fighting for the rights of small nations, uh, which is a laughable idea, given that they were the British Empire at that time. But at least that's uh, what they claimed, uh, that they entered the war to defend the rights of Belgium. But uh, now, uh, you know, uh, at least with this crisis, I'm hoping that uh, more people will wake up to the ugliness of, uh, you know, large countries. Uh, brutalizing small ones. Yes, well, I, I, I do agree with that. I'm going to share my screen very briefly just to uh, uh, highlight uh, an article that you can find on my blog, dnight.blog. Uh, you can see the cartoon. I don't know if it's big enough, but uh, it basically uh, shows Uncle Sam kind of hiding uh, the rug covering uh, skulls and skeletons from its wars in Syria, Iraq, uh, Somalia, and Libya, saying, I strongly condemn Russia's attack on Ukraine. This is a, an article I wrote, Shock and Awe, Then and Now, which, as I say, you can see on my blog. Uh, and I, uh, uh, I was uh, pleased that um, uh, What's his name? Stan Smith spoke, spoke last week on that subject and was able, uh, in spite of the uh, avalanche of condemnation uh, of uh, uh, Russia's military operation in Ukraine, uh, was able to highlight that the whole thing could have been avoided. Uh, uh, specifically by the United States and NATO, uh, if it had uh, uh, recognized that, you know, pushing for a NATO presence in Ukraine was wrong and building up support for uh, a far right wing uh, uh, Nazi filled uh, government in, in Ukraine was something the US itself had uh, uh, fostered back in uh, 2014. It's a complicated issue, and I don't mind talking about it. But the key thing to know is, for, interestingly, even President Biden has recognized the danger of World War III that is uh, uh, right on the edge of happening if, uh, if the US government were to agree uh, to, for example, uh, the so-called no-flight zone um, and uh, has refused to do it. I think that we're going to have to uh, put pressure to make sure that doesn't happen because there are people who either don't know what a no-flight zone is or who are crazy enough to think we should risk World War III uh, for it. I think there is a chance uh, there are uh, negotiations underway uh, between the governments of Russia and Ukraine. And uh, if the United States would uh, stop pressing for 
uh, more arming for Ukraine and start going for a settlement, we could end that war. Uh, and we need to recognize that peace indeed could happen. You know, the cost of war is far too high. It's possible to have peace uh, and we have to push for it. Well, that's a partial answer. I think uh, it's a different answer. But uh, is that, uh, you know, I mean, is peace the overriding goal? I mean, you can have peace of the graveyard. You can have a peace in which your future generations uh, live under the boot of some, uh, you know, sick, uh, psychopathic uh, dictator, uh, which Putin definitely is. Uh, so there can be situations where, you know, peace is uh, kind of pop out. Well, it's a good question. I, 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 I do not share your view uh, about Putin, which of course to not share that during the current atmosphere seems odd. It's, you know, it reminds me of uh, the demonization of pretty much every uh, leader of a country that the United States uh, wanted to have war with. Uh, I think that what we have to recognize that it's possible to have not merely the absence of war, but a peace that's based on uh, sharing the prosperity of the world. And the, the biggest boot that most of the people of the world are under is an American one. And I, you know, I know that it's uh, uh, controversial to say that, but in fact, it's true. The, the, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today is the United States government and the, uh, the poverty and oppression that uh, can be easily seen uh, all over the world, but especially in the Middle East, Africa, Asia, and Latin America is largely traceable to uh, the, the, uh, the imperialism of the United States, in my opinion. Okay, uh, Dan, I do believe you were next, so go ahead. Dan. Uh, Dan, you, you had a question you were asked earlier about. Okay. He disappeared. All right, Dan, uh, I'll come back to you. Ellen, you're next. Yeah, Luke has one and then I have one. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, uh, my question, thank you very much. Uh, my, my name's Luke uh, uh, Matthews D. Thank you very much for your presentation and and uh, your dedication to uh, 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 to stopping war and peace. My question has to do with uh, 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 pacifism. Uh, um, you know, I was just gonna say, are you a pacifist? In other words, you know, I remember Bern, uh, Bernie Sanders on the campaign trail, he said, you know, I am not a pacifist. I mean, he's not against all war. There's some war that is justified was what he was saying, although he was against the 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 uh, second Iraq war. I believe he I think he voted yes for the first Iraq war. So my question to you, are you against all wars of any kind? Uh, is there any justification for war? And then specifically, for instance, the NATO I think it's Article Five that says if one uh, nation is invaded, all will all are invaded. So, if, for instance, Russia were to, in you know, try and take over Lithuania or invade Lithuania or something or whatever country, it would that be a justification uh, for war? So, I just wanted a clarification on that uh, from your uh, point of view. Thank you for that question, and it's a challenging one. Uh, I would like. I think to take it back to uh, the Vietnam War that I cut my teeth on, you know, and that was the one that I applied for conscientious objector status, saying that I was uh, uh, I I was against fighting in that war. I had to recognize the justness of the Vietnamese resistance in that war. I came to, and it's in my book. One, the, the, I think it's the first uh, appendix in my book <coughs> talks about. Uh, the People's War of Resistance uh, in uh, Vietnam. And uh, it would be uh, inconsistent for me if I said that I'm an absolute pacifist, when, but, and, and, uh, and yet I strongly uh, 
supported and justified the people's war of the Vietnamese against uh, French colonialism and, and the United States aggression during that time. The uh, hypothetical uh, question that you raised about what should we do about a, a possible invasion of Lithuania either by any of its neighbors. And I'm sure that what you mean by that is by Russia. Uh, let me just say, I see Frank is saying, get rid of NATO. Uh, uh, I do think that we should get rid of NATO and it would, it would uh, make it far less likely that we would have um, uh, either the current war uh, uh, in Ukraine or, for example, the war in Yugoslavia that took place in the late 1990s. Um, and it's tough because uh, we're in a country that uh, uh, basically mobilizes for aggressive war against other countries. That was true in Vietnam. It was true in Korea. It was true in Iraq and uh, Afghanistan uh, and in Libya. In the case of Libya, they only used bombers. They didn't use troops, but the effect was the same. In other words, what we have is what I would call uh, an opposition to unjustified aggressive wars. And that's the kind uh, that uh, uh, young people in this country are constantly called on to be the cannon fodder for. Okay, good clarification. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, then have questions. No, no, no. Ellen is next, and then Margaret, and then I'll go back to Dan. Excuse me, point of order, my hands up. Well, uh -huh. I did send you a message. No, no, no. Uh, okay. Okay. You right, do so. this, Tim, why you do this? Okay, then just uh, one uh, second. Uh, Dan, but Dan was on the list, but go ahead, oh, Dan. Let Dan. Let Dan go. He was there, and then he was Go ahead, Dan. Okay. All right. My question is, um, what if Ukraine joined NATO? What will happen? It would be an unmitigated disaster, uh, uh, not only for uh, Ukraine, but for uh, really the rest of the world. Uh, and, you know, we should really be clear about this joint NATO business. You know, uh, since the late 90s, uh, uh, the countries that became members of uh, NATO uh, increased from uh, 12 to 30. Uh, it's possible that in some cases, the governments of those country asked for or even begged to join NATO. But I can tell you frankly, and I think that we should look at this, uh, who, who encouraged them, who uh, pushed them to join and why? The United States government has been the leading force in NATO as an aggressive, offensive military alliance. Uh, from its very start back in 1949, but especially after the collapse of uh, the Soviet Union in 1991. When the, when the Soviet Union collapsed, of course, the worst Warsaw Pact ceased to exist. Logically, NATO should have ceased to exist at that time. Instead, it, uh, it has engaged in a series of aggressive military adventures uh, uh, since that time, uh, starting in Yugoslavia to uh, destroy that last socialist uh, uh, government uh, in Europe. Uh, uh, of course, it has been used in Iraq and in Afghanistan to disastrous uh, results. It was used to destroy the government of Libya, uh, which, by the way, was the most prosperous country in Africa. Uh, and it's being used now in China, not exactly in the North Atlantic. Uh, and the suggestion I'm making is that uh, stopping NATO really, in my view, should be our priority, stopping and abolishing NATO. And if we did that, we would find that it was a whole lot easier 
to uh, achieve peace. Coming back to the Ukraine, my observation is that uh, what has happened in the Ukraine would not have happened were it not for NATO and the pressure campaign of the US government to use NATO to push back against Russia. I have a question, very quick, uh, like edit, uh, if I may. Uh, talking yeah, about your ahead, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, uh, thank you so much uh, for your speech. Um, my question is, look, Poland is also very close uh, border to Ukraine, but look at the Poland. Poland, member of the NATO, look how they feel strong. And they're not uh, afraid right now to, you know, bring more than 3,000 uh, military to the border. So, uh, you know, if Poland not afraid, and uh, Zelensky today gave speech, you know, and uh, in the Kiev, before Kiev was gonna be bombed because they afraid Kiev can be bombed any moment now. Unfortunate, I hope it will never happen. So. My question is, Zelensky said they're not afraid of nothing, uh, despite so many refugees, uh, you know, out from the Ukraine. Go any Google or YouTube and you will see. So many just get out from Ukraine right now. Then what Ukraine afraid of? You hmm. think really Putin will do this? No, because you know, people know what he's doing now towards to Ukraine. You know what, if people will afraid, and if people, even in NATO, will at least not give him another warning, big warning what he's doing wrong, then you know what, he will make fun of those sanctions and those NATO and stuff. People need to know they not to be afraid and not to keep silent. And if everybody will right now, at least somehow emotionally, physically, financially, will help to Ukraine because Ukraine was used to, to be part of Russia. Russia and Russia, very big territory. My question is, uh, sir, don't you think slowly Ukraine, if they claim not to, to be afraid of nothing, they need to be slowly member of the NATO. Then maybe NATO can protect Ukraine and despise Putin right now. Thank you. I wait for response. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you for your question. Thank First, you. I would like to express my uh, recognition and mm -hmm. that people's hearts go out uh, mm -hmm. to the people of Ukraine now. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it would have been better had they gone out to the people of Ukraine eight years ago in 2014. Right. When right, this crisis right. began. Uh, right. And to recognize that. Uh, when um, uh, Victoria Newland and uh, John McCain and other uh, far right wing American uh, politicians and but at least they like stopped for a while, right? I'm, they I'm sorry, for a while. I, I listened to you, and now yeah, I'm yeah, answering you. you. Please I'm forgive sorry. me. Uh, we have a, a a situation that was created and mm -hmm. and fostered mm -hmm. by. Uh, far right wing United States politicians to build to break a government, a democratic elected government in Ukraine uh, mm -hmm. that wanted to balance uh, Ukraine between Russia and Europe. The United States wanted to prevent that. And exactly why we are where we are and how we can get out is a thorny question and a passionate debate. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that. Uh, uh, the leadership of Russia has said that they would be willing to end the war tomorrow, mm -hmm. even today, uh, on the basis of uh, commitment uh, for Ukraine not to be part of NATO, mm -hmm. for uh, denazification and de demilitarization to take place, uh, and to stop the killings of Russian speakers in eastern Ukraine. It's good to remember that... Uh, you miss a bit. Uh, okay, just you know, you missed a bit, and the um, uh, and a, and a certain amount of wait, wait, I'm sorry, I thought the rule was that I, you know, I well, no, you missed a bit. I'm I, uh, just interrupting, that's all. Stop and get up. I just all wanted right, to the finish was that over 14,000 mm -hmm. uh, uh, 
Russian speakers in Eastern Ukraine have mm -hmm. been killed between 2014 and late 2021. Mm -hmm. More have been killed since then, vastly more than uh, uh, Ukrainians who have been killed. Actually, the, the Russian military operation has used uh, cauldrons as opposed to uh, the kind of campaigns that the, uh, the uh, war propaganda in American papers says. But besides that, what is clear is that the war could be ended if there were a commitment on the side of both Ukraine and the United States and its NATO allies to mm -hmm. stop it. There's the basis for a settlement. It has been uh, reported uh, daily over the past week in the negotiations. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we have to be aware that we're in the midst of a fog of war and an intense mm -hmm. propaganda campaign mm -hmm. that has demonized the leadership of Russia and is not trying for peace. Peace is available. Mm -hmm. All right, next, next question, Margaret, go ahead. And then I got uh, Joseph and then I got Frank. You missed me, Tim. I, I let oh, I'm sorry, that. Ellen, go ahead. Yeah. Go to Margaret. Okay, okay thanks. Uh, yeah. Uh, I just would, this is Margaret, a I'm, left turn from, the, from what's being discussed. Would you talk about, if, if, if I'm, I'm not following it closely, but it sounds like in Nicaragua, uh, the government of Daniel Ortega has really turned around and is not um, and is not being as, as um, useful or as democratic or whatever as it was before. And so, if you could comment on that and how much of that is is propaganda from our side and how much is propaganda from their side and all that jazz. Sure, and thanks for that question. Uh, it is included, a, a discussion of that very issue is included in my book. Um, I don't necessarily want to read everything from that right now, but I will say that yes, it is the result of uh, uh, an intense US propaganda campaign that uh, uh, has been exposed by others besides myself. Uh, in fact, uh, at the risk of seeming ridiculous, I will say that there is vastly more democr uh, democracy and democratic process in Nicaragua today than there is in the United States today. And um, uh, maybe I should say, I, I should give you just a little bit of it. Um, uh, my friend Jerry Condon, who I've mentioned, um, uh, wrote in uh, July of last year, why do the media hate Daniel Ortega? He said recent polls show the Ortega government retaining widespread support and easily defeating even a united opposition ticket. They have nothing to fear from the ballot box. After explaining the money laundering issue, uh, 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 the Ortega government was... Uh, confronted by uh, a US-backed counter uh, revolution that led to uh, over 200 people being killed in street violence. More than half of them were Sandinistas, including 24 police. I, 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 it was really a classic CIA color revolution that failed, uh, but USAID and the National uh, Endowment for Democracy haven't stopped and the US Congress has imposed brutal sanctions that punish the Nicaraguan people for supporting the Sandinista uh, government. So all I can say is that the, the evidence is there that it's not, uh, uh, it's not Daniel Ortega and the Sandinista who have been causing problems in, in Nicaragua. They've been solving problems there, but the United States hates them just as they hate uh, Cuba and Venezuela. And it, it's really incumbent on us uh, to get to the bottom of that and not be fooled by the propaganda that is so uh, intensely uh, uh, promulgated in the, in the US press and by uh, corrupt American politicians. Okay, uh, is that it, Margaret, on your questions? And then Ellen, I know you had a 
I'll, I'll finish up with you and then we'll go to Joseph and Frank. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I uh, appreciate your work too. I, I uh, have come at this later in life, but uh, and learning from your your history uh, now. And um, it, I guess the question I have, the main one is there. You know, this idea of that you said you worked at the UN. I don't know if you knew that the um, the National Security Restoration Act of of 1994, part of the contract with America. Um, started giving three fifths of all the money to UN to NATO. And so to me, these little, like, you know, we're funding this. And another, another thing that nobody talks about is the fairness doctrine that was thrown out, the FCC fairness doctrine that would have required the broadcasters to present issues in a fair and balanced way regarding war and, you know, Russia versus Ukraine. And also the Gillette Amendment of 1913 said that the government is not allowed to do public relations, um, you know, out of the Oval Office. It leads to abuse of power. And so to me, there's these, is there a way we could kind of negotiate uh, to, um, we, we're, we've got, un, you know, we things are worse now. Also, it seems like, you know, since we don't have a draft, people are just kind of unaware of the blood and the pain and the torture. I just wish there was a way to get the total truth that we don't get and, and the censorship also. And have you two, have you ever heard of Prevailing Winds magazine? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and one other thing, Re Louise Ransom, my friend Matt, I think that might've been his mother uh, from Bronxville, New York. Um, so anyhow, uh, that I grew up with Matt Ransom. Uh, How about so I, that? Yeah. Well, she became a good friend uh and and uh uh we worked together during the amnesty campaign and of course i'll be forever grateful for the courage of of uh solidarity that she and her husband both showed uh to war resistors the task of of clearing through the fog and uh overcoming the immense power negative power of official lies in propaganda coming from uh, both Congress and the White House, it's a major task. Uh, you know, I've actually had to devote a huge part of my life to that. And I think all of us, for better or worse, have the responsibility to sort through uh, and fight through the lies to find truth. And it's especially hard now. And we, uh, as far as uh, U.S. government redirecting funds that should have gone to the U.N. to NATO. That, uh, in my humble opinion, is a crime. Uh, NATO should be abolished and the U.N. should be reinforced because it is actually the one uh, facility through which the governments of all the countries of the world can express their views. That, by the way, is one of the reasons that the U.S. government has stopped funding it the way they used to. Mm. Mm -hmm. Much more could be said, but that's a story. Were you aware of that? Is that, am I, facts right with that, NATO? Yes. Are people yes. commonly aware of that? Okay. Yes, you're, you're, mm -hmm. you're correct about that. And, and by the way, I mean, uh, NATO is a vastly different animal than U.N. peace forces. U.N. peace forces are about keeping the peace. NATO is about waging war. That's a big difference. Dirty wars. <laughs> yeah. Planned by Rand. Joseph is next. <laughs> okay. Joseph, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Charlie. Um, thank you, Dee. Uh, it was a very impressive, uh, informative, and insightful story of a person and people of diverse views like you. Uh, my first question, if I may, what is your uh, political affiliation? Do you identify as a communist? I'm a member of the Democratic Socialists of America uh, and, a, and, and I participate actively in DSA's International Committee. Uh, uh, what does that mean about my political beliefs? I'm a strong believer in socialism. Uh, I think that uh, capitalism uh, has 
long outlived its usefulness. Uh, and uh, what we have in, in our country today is a tremendous uh, failure uh, of uh, all the measures by which a healthy society can be judged. Uh, we have a uh, uh, gigantic uh, gap between the 1% and the 99% in terms of uh, uh, economic security. We have uh, massive homelessness in the richest country in the world. Everything says to me that capitalism has outlived its usefulness and we need socialism. And I do strongly believe in socialism. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, may I know, is there any uh, country today or uh, from yesterday's uh, which uh, align um, reasonably with your uh, uh, political view of socialism? I'm sorry, I don't quite understand the question. Could you repeat it? Is, is there any country which comes close to the implementation of the socialistic ideas you articulated today or in yesterday's? Well, I've already uh, spoken in defense of the Sandinista government of Nicaragua. Uh, I met personally Daniel Ortega. Uh, uh, he became a personal friend. Uh, I actually fixed his computer back in 1989. Uh, I've been to Cuba and uh, think that it's a remarkable country uh, and has managed despite being strangled for literally uh, 60 years by the United States uh, continues to uh, uh, struggle to have socialism. And I think that they're doing a, a remarkable job under the circumstances. I also defend the uh, 21st century socialism projects in Venezuela uh, and Bolivia. And I can tell you that I think that uh, China uh, is very strongly supporting 21st century socialism in those countries. And despite the uh, uh, propaganda against China, I actually think uh, China's doing quite a good job and is leading uh, uh, the world economically now uh, and has the support of uh, the vast majority of its people, over 90%. Uh, and I disbelieve all the talk of human rights violations, et cetera. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, you say that you have hope of a coalition of diversity uh, in creating an ideal nation. Uh, I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> um, my question is, as a practical matter, at the foundations of nationhood and patriotism is uh, monolithic views, uh, racism, we the majority, they the minority, Jew the Gentile, the people on the other side of the border, etc. Yes, uh, I we, believe, I believe, let me ahead. complete. Sorry. I believe this is a fundamental issue, uh, but practically at play and even necessary to maintain nation states and also the reason for most wars. How do you reconcile the ideal with some of these realities? That's a very, very good question and extremely challenging to answer. In a way, I think that it might be good to compare our situation here with the situation uh, of South Africa prior to the demise uh, and defeat of apartheid. Of course, uh, the people of South Africa had lived for centuries before they were invaded uh, by European settlers uh, five centuries ago. And it took almost five centuries to, uh, to uh, defeat the settler colonialism there so that uh, the majority of people could run their country. Here, we've had settler colonialism for longer even than, um, than the country 
has formally existed. And of course, it was uh, uh, sadly, you know, really built on a combination of genocide and slavery. And we do need to recognize that and come to terms with this if we're to have a future uh, that can be uh, based on social justice and peace. Uh, and many, many things will need to be transformed. But my faith is that really the majority of people in this country uh, do not and will not gain from uh, continued uh, uh, racism uh, and inequality that still are the foundation of our society. But of course, it will involve a struggle and a transformation of the whole basis on which the society is founded. And I don't blanch at that. Uh, my book aims to point to the point in a direction of what we need to do in order to have a just society, but it would be a revolutionary transformation. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. I, I agree in principle, but uh, the, <laughs> the last Joseph, question, I, 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 will, Joseph, I will stop. Joseph, Joseph, we got to move on, okay? All right, Frank, thank you. You're next. No problem. Frank, you're next. Um, hi. Thank you, Dee. That was a fantastic presentation. I just want to put up March the 20th, uh, 2003, the U.S. attacked uh, Iraq. This was the headline on the Chicago Tribune. And it says, uh, Bush launches a preemptive war to oust Hussein. Long, difficult campaign ahead, President warns. Crude missiles aimed at targets in the Baghdad area. Now, I'm assuming that most of us in this meeting knew before the invasion that we were being lied to, that we were being propagandized. Um, I, my question was, I mean, you've had a lot of experience of combating American propaganda, and we've already touched on that a little bit, but if you could comment on that. Right now, we're subject to CNN, MSNBC, basically singing the State Department talking points. And when, in propaganda, when we talk about propaganda in this country, we're usually referring to Russian propaganda or Chinese propaganda. How do we overcome US domestic propaganda? That's just one question. But secondly, also economic sanctions. They are now a weapon of war. We are gonna have starvation possibly because of the wheat supplies being curtailed, oil, gas. We're gonna have serious problems because of the economic sanctions against Russia. And if you could also comment on economic sanctions as a, as a weapon of war. Right. Well, thank you very much for bringing up uh, the Iraq parallel. It's worth pointing out that the destructiveness of the U.S. assault on Iraq was several orders of magnitude greater than the military operation of Russia in Ukraine up to this point. Uh, uh, it's a little bit difficult for people to see that with the barrage of war propaganda that uh, we've been subjected to during these last two and a half weeks. Um, and um, it's, I, I guess I should probably also uh, draw your attention back to uh, the uh, piece that I wrote uh, uh, that you can see on my blog, dnight.blog. I'm just going to put it on the screen because it very much does, you know, compare the shock and awe campaign against Iraq uh, and with a new kind of shock and awe as uh, the official uh, Washington version makes it seem like uh, what's going on in Russia is much worse than anything that ever happened anywhere else in the world ever. Well, it's not really true, you know, uh, and uh, uh, it's necessary for us to be aware that uh, we live in a country dominated by a propaganda machine that's as, 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 powerful as anything the world has ever seen. And uh, it's uh, in that article, which I commend to you, uh, one of the uh, economists I cite, Michael H Hudson says that uh, he believes that uh, the motivation for uh, the 
attacks against Russia that led to this situation were about turning West Europe against Russia and China. And regarding the sanctions, uh, his observations is that they're going to hurt Western Europe far more than they're going to hurt Russia. Uh, in fact, you know, the, the effort to stop shipment of Russian gas and oil to, to uh, Western Europe is strangling Western Europe. They're also leading to uh, potential uh, famine and starvation in uh, North Africa and the Middle East, which are both dependent on uh, wheat from uh, Russia and the Ukraine. Whether Russia can withstand the, the sanctions or not is an interesting question. It turns out that you know they've stored up gold uh, to in, in preparation for um, uh, the economic strangulation uh, that has happened so far. And of course, they have what is called a rock solid friendship with. Uh, China that is uh, providing essentially together with India a limitless uh, uh, customer for all of their gas and oil. So who's going to suffer most? We're already seeing a uh, rapid rise in gasoline prices at the pump here in the U.S. and rampant inf inflation. The result could be uh, a, a collapse of the global economy, which we would all suffer from tremendously. Whether it happens is hard to know. Uh, I believe that if some of the big talkers in Washington would wake up, they could stop this whole thing in a heartbeat. And we could avoid a calamity, which, as I say, is going to affect pretty much everybody else in the world, frankly, more than the people of Russia and even the people of Ukraine. Uh, and by the way, we should recognize that sanctions are a form of war themselves and are uh, violations of international law. If we were to uh, try and put together on a scale the violations of international law, both from wartime sanctions and from wars themselves, we would find that the weight was so heavily on uh, against the United States government, that these people would have to stop talking because they'd be ashamed, although they have not demonstrated much capacity for shame. Okay, Frank, are you done with your question? Okay, Charlie, you're next. I think uh, Calvin from Liverpool is next. Okay, Calvin. Calvin, uh, did you Calvin okay, uh, uh, all yeah, right, Calvin. Uh, Dave, firstly, I, I, you know, I like to, I'd like to thank you for your, your talk, and it was very illuminating, especially a guy who grew up on the other side of the pond and listened to Bob Dylan and Country Joe McDonald and all that kind of stuff that went on. Um, it was the war that we didn't get involved in. Um, firstly, you say that you're not a pacifist, and I, I understand that, and you supported the, the, the Vietnamese struggle. Um, would I, I would ask you, is there anything you would take up arms? I mean, I'm reminded by I'm reminded by what Alistair Cook said about the Vietnam War. And he said there was thousands of young Americans that would have seen a danger in Hitler and would have fought him that would not that, 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 that saw no evil in the Viet, Viet Cong. Um, right. Right. Uh, at what point would you distinguish between uh, Hitler and uh, Assad and Hussein. What, what point do you, where do you say this is propaganda and this is something I need to get, I need, I need to take arms up against? Um, it's a really good question. Um, and uh, I have several others as well, yeah. Okay, go ahead. I, I didn't mean to interrupt. All right. Um, also, one of the questions that came up um, was, um, you put a great deal of faith into the UN and not much, in, and you think NATO is um, a wet fag end, a wet, a wet cigarette end. Sorry. <laughs> different, different meaning in Britain. It's okay, it's okay, go ahead. Um, uh, I have a friend who actually served in NATO in, um, in, in uh, Bosnia. And he says the difference between NATO and uh, the UN 
is the NATO NATO forces say, please stop fighting. And the, uh, uh, the UN forces say, please stop fighting. And the NATO ones stick a gun in your face and say, stop fighting or we'll shoot you. Well, uh, I think that's and if you're, uh, if you're if you're somebody caught in the middle of uh, 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 like a Bosnian type conflict, and, you know, they're the guys you want on you, uh, uh, to my mind. Um, well, and just, I just, I, I wondered yeah. how, how, why you would have such faith in an organization that voted the Saudi Arabia, the uh, chairman of the women's rights uh, organization for the UN. You know, th that's, you know, we're talking about, I mean, even if we are talking about the UN, we're talking about 198 uh, votes against the Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine. You know, uh, the UN is an incredibly flawed um, institution. NATO. Um, oh, it's incredibly flawed. Okay. Yeah. All well, right. Just to, um, just, just, to, just to give an answer to what you've given us so far, uh, I guess I would focus on uh, NATO in Yugoslavia. Um, that wasn't about stopping fighting. That was about destroying a government, and it involved. And the government uh, was already destroyed. Actually, it was already fragmented. You, you had your tribal warfare everywhere. Well, the the NATO bombing campaign uh, literally dropped twenty eight thousand bombs uh, on what was left of Yugoslavia. Managed to include a bomb on the Chinese embassy in Belgrade into the bargain. Uh, which uh, uh, ended up being uh, uh, not merely a shocker, but wasn't the main event. The main event was uh, literally uh, uh, destroying uh, Yugoslavia. And it's necessary to uh, really highlight, as I did before, the difference between peacekeeping and war making. NATO is a war making operation. Uh, and it has been making war continuously. Uh, Yugoslavia was just the beginning, but uh, we, all, we saw 20 years of NATO war in Afghanistan that ended badly. The only people that really benefited from any of those NATO wars were the masters of war in the military industrial complex, even as the US withdrew in shame from Afghanistan, the main complaint from Raytheon and uh, Northrop and Lockheed Martin was that their stocks were going to go down. They were rescued uh, by uh, uh, the revival of NATO uh, in this uh, latest situation and are very, very happy about you know, the, the possibility of uh, continued and expanded war. And we um, need to, we I, I, I bet you, I mean, the, the, what, I, what I got from the Yugoslavian hey. conflict was not so much the bombing by NATO, it was the genocide in Srebrenica. Well, we disagree. Okay, uh, let's you have, okay. You have, you have basically, basically All right, Kelvin, them. Kelvin, we oh. got to move on. All right, okay, I'll wait for time. All right, thanks, Kelvin. Okay, so Charlie, you're next. Yeah, the, uh, occasionally I see a commercial running on television uh, where a young man, 17 or 18 years old, uh, comes home and has a brochure and asks mom if he can join the army, uh, <coughs> be all that you can be. And I was wondering, what, what would you tell the the young person, if you were the parent, and you, they asked you, uh, "Dad, could I? I'd like to join the army." What would, what would you tell them? I'd say, "Honey, don't go. It's it's a terrible, terrible idea. You're being you're being suckered into uh, uh, something that could cost you your life or make you wish you were dead after you after you come." Uh, come back home uh, uh, partially destroyed. I'd also say, honey, I know it's hard to get a job and it's really tough uh, to be able to uh, 
uh, go to school, get an education, but we've got to figure out some way to get that to happen. You don't have to volunteer to be cannon fodder. It's a really bad idea. They're using the fact that uh, we're poor, that, uh, that unlike years ago, uh, when we were going to college for free, now you end up having to be uh, go in debt for life to get a college education. But we should find a way. We should do anything necessary to keep you from making this terrible decision that could ruin your life, even if you live through it. Good answer. Okay, next, Ernie. Ah uh, yes, can y'all hear me? Am I? I'm not far off of mute. Uh, I'm very sorry. I'm very sorry I didn't get into this uh, uh, meeting until shortly before eight o'clock. I had something else going, and I can tell from the questions and answers that it was a very very interesting talk. And I wish I'd heard the whole thing. But uh, uh, I, there are a whole dump, bunch of areas that I'd like to pursue with D about his his views of things. We won't have time to do that now. Uh, with re I will bring up just one issue regarding the current war that's going on in Ukraine and the, uh, the Budapest Memorandum. Has that been brought up in this discussion tonight? It what? hasn't, and it's go, go ahead. It's a good idea to bring that up. What is it called? All right, well, the Budapest me Memorandum, uh, depending, you know, Lawyers, lawyers like to twist things uh, for the benefit of their clients and their clients now are the US government and other governments that don't wanna to go to war. They don't wanna live up to an agreement that they made back in I believe 1994, when the, so after the Soviet Union broke up, uh, the US and the other nuclear powers wanted the minor nuclear powers, including Ukraine and Kazakhstan to give up their nuclear weapons. Kazakhstan did without much of a uh, discussion, but Ukraine uh, was, was uh, uh, justifiably concerned about doing that. And they were promised if they did, that they would receive, uh, I don't know the exact wording, but it amounted to protection uh, if they were willing to give up their nuclear weapons. Now, they're supposed to get that protection from both Russia and the US and Great Britain and I don't know who else. And of course now, uh, the, when, when it's brought up, I listen to, I've been listening to two to six hours a day of news since Ukraine began. And I only, I didn't hear it at all. Doug claims he heard, I believe Wolf Blitzer say, uh, Budapest Mem Memorandum one. They're, they're just avoiding the topic. I've heard it, it on the It's been mentioned on MSP. Yeah. 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 Let me finish. Yeah. Let, me finish. Let me finish. Yeah. Okay, it proves again, that the United States cannot be depended upon. Uh, I think the biggest problem with NATO is that if, if uh, uh, somebody did, if, if, the, uh, if the Russians decide to go into Estonia or something like that, I can't see that the, the NATO people are, they're gonna say, well, we, we really don't wanna do that and da, 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 da. And you can argue, well, that's a good thing. They don't wanna go to war, but I, I think they would avoid it because they don't wanna make the sacrifice, not because there's any moral problem with it. And I think that's what we have here. Uh, there's yeah. a moral op obligation at the very least and probably a legal obligation on the part of the US and Great Britain and Russia. Of course, Russia is invading Ukraine. So for whatever reason, if you agree with that, that, that they should be or that they shouldn't be, they're doing it. So obviously they aren't protecting Ukraine, but the US and Great Britain have an obligation to protect Ukraine and we are basically avoiding it. And uh, that's my take on the uh, on the Budapest Memorandum. It's like like any other tr treaty that becomes inconvenient. This is a question, you know, period, oops, Ernie. Throw it question. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm done now. Now I'd like to hear Dee's answer on that. Sure. Well, I think the key to the uh, to that memorandum and the, and the key lesson is that it's necessary to uh, uh, drastically limit. Uh, and go towards abolishing nuclear weapons. And what we've seen, uh, it, it's, it's true that the three guarantors of 
the former Soviet republics like Ukraine giving up their nuclear weapons, the three guarantors would be the United States, Britain, and Russia. But we should not uh, get hypnotized by that and ignore what has happened in recent years, including the abrogation of the INF, the, uh, uh, the Nuclear Forces Treaty that Trump uh, ended and which has caused so much uh, uh, upset uh, in Russia because essentially what it says is that uh, 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 NATO uh, can deploy uh, short range uh, nuclear missiles in the NATO countries from the for former Soviet Union, specifically Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia, as well as uh, uh, Romania and Poland and uh, several other countries that have caused uh, the Russians to feel that uh, their cities could be obliterated in five minutes uh, and have pushed us into uh, the situation where uh, this um, so-called no-fly zone could have us all obliterated in 10 minutes. You know, the, the, the thing about uh, the nuclear danger is that it's more dangerous today than it has been since 1962 during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And it's not just the uh, uh, Budapest uh, memorandum, it's also the, uh, uh, the other failures of diplomacy that have happened since that have left us on the brink of nuclear catastrophe. And yes, it should be stopped. Okay, our so, next- So there, we should in no way honor the agreement to protect Ukraine under the circumstances. Well, uh, nuclear protection is not the issue here. The, the way to protect Ukraine is to stop pushing them to continue a war that can be stopped tomorrow. All that's needed is the will to stop that war. And it's really, you know, every time the uh, Ukrainian government of Zelensky comes close to an agreement with Russia, they get a phone call from the United States and say, don't do it. We, we can give you more weapons. And, and by the way, we can probably get some of those MiG-29s from Poland over to you and you can defend yourself. You know, in other words, what we have is uh, a case where the United States government is essentially saying to Ukraine, we would like to see this war continue to the last Ukrainian. That's not protection. That's, that's you know, uh, uh, goading both sides. To I, I agree. That's not protection. Protection, when you have a very small power being invaded by a large power, protection is when another large power gets involved uh, to prevent it if possible. Of course, it's too late to prevent it. And, and, there, and now it would be much nastier than it would have been before. But uh, uh, yeah, well, we can say, oh yeah, the way, to, way, the way to cut damage in war is for the people being attacked is to simply lay down on their back and give up. Well, actually, uh, uh, we do disagree about that. I believe that uh, the United States could put a stop to this war very, very quickly and get a solution that would be satisfactory to both sides. And it would not have to do with having anybody on their back at all. Uh, it would be uh, uh, stopping uh, the process of making Ukraine a pawn in a bigger war game. Uh, it's, well, it's I, true, I they are a proxy. Thank yeah. you, Ernie. Ellen. Okay. Um, hi. Um, well, I suppose I have two questions. Um, one is, um, I'm wondering whether I, I sometimes I feel like this war is a form of exemplifies a form of racism because we really don't hear anything about Yemen anymore um, or other conflicts in Africa. And we, I mean, you've even heard it on, it's even been heard on certain news programs. Oh, these people look like us. And I mean, and it, and it is kind of human nature to be that way, but 
you know, we're, we're supposed to be educated, civilized people who can look beyond that. It seems like we care about this because they're Europeans. Um, and maybe I, maybe I, uh, I, I kind of, uh, um, kind of laid down and took, <laughs> I was tired during the um, presentation, so I didn't hear everything. And that, I mean, would you think that we, we don't seem to care about certain people? We don't seem to care about, the, yeah, the, 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 the Yemenis and other people. Um, what do you think about that? Well, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, I put uh, the article I wrote about uh, shock and awe then and now on the screen again and sent uh, once again comparing the U.S. wars against uh, Yemen, Somalia, Iraq, Syria, and Lib Libya. I would I, I quoted uh, Margaret Kimberly, the editor of Black Agenda Report, that said, "It's really the white supremacist underpinnings of the U.S." NATO foreign policy, which has created all of Ukraine's suffering. The narrative that only white people deserve peace and security is all the more shameful because the global South suffers from war and privation as a direct result of US NATO wars. It's NATO that destroyed the nation of Libya, NATO which attempted to do the same in Syria, NATO that occupied Afghanistan, NATO which wages war across African countries with US, French, and British troops deployed. And it says, uh, Kimberly adds that Ukraine has been pushed to the fourth front of American thought in order to defend the imperialist foreign policy which led to the current conflict with Asia. If a blue-eyed nation is suffering, it's because the US and NATO arrogance and aggression. NATO's current situation is a direct result of the 2014 coup engineered by the US and its EU partners. An elected president was dispatched and a civil war begun that has killed some 14,000 people. Ukraine is a U.S. colony with a puppet government now under military attack. And we could go on. Uh, okay. But... Let's, go right. to, let's go to... Oh, oh, okay, I, I, okay, I have one more quick question. Is Don't you think that there is a serious problem with um, the media in the United States being a propaganda, a group of propaganda organization. I yes, mean, you I don't do. hear anything on NPR or most of these stations about um, opposition to, 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 to the war. All you hear is um, these poor suffering Ukrainians and Russia's bad. You don't hear any diverse opinions. This, I know. This is propaganda yeah. and I see it over and over again. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, an old friend of mine during the uh, NATO war uh, on Yugoslavia uh, referred to NPR as National Pentagon Radio. You have a situation <laughs> where, you know, the, the, the official mainstream media is a captive of uh, both its owners on the one hand, all of them are owned by the very large corporations and their advertisers, but also by official Washington. One of the things that uh, was noted uh, in both the Bush uh, uh, aggressions in Iraq was that uh, Washington and the Pentagon had learned the lesson of Vietnam and made sure to keep a very, very tight muzzle on the media uh, in, in, in the war in Iraq. And now the media has muzzled itself so that really there are a bunch of stenographers for the official uh, government version. Yeah. We, 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 you know, I personally am spending night and day uh, uh, searching out sources and writing uh, articles that can appear in various places. I use uh, LA Progressive, which is an online news uh, source uh, to publish articles, as well as Covered Action magazine, which is also mainly online, but is published. And I uh, also depend on uh, popularresistance.org, which is a collection of alternate media sources. It's extremely difficult both to find uh, trustworthy, reliable news and to get it out there. All right, let's okay, go. Okay, I, I have a question. I just, 
The All thing right. won't let me put a hand up. All Is right, Doug, you? you're next. I have a question. I would like to know. I I couldn't hear the whole thing either, so maybe he dealt with this. I would All like right, to know Doug. if D doesn't understand the similarity of what Putin is doing to what Hitler did in 1938-39. And that the, the this BS about the Donbass and the other province, that they were Russian speaking. So he had to take them over. And if he could take them over, he had to invade the entire Ukraine. That's so similar to what Hitler did by demanding the Sudetenland. And in that case, we had a Neville Chamberlain give it up to him, and then he could take over all Czechoslovakia six months or a year later because the Sudetenland was the uh, region of all of the fortresses that Czechoslovakia had at that time, and then they were almost defenseless. So if you, do you see the analogy or don't you? And do you understand that Hitler is not a socialist or a communist that if he took over the whole world, you could live in a damn communist or socialist utopia, which is idiotic. If you don't see that Putin is a dictator, he's taking away everyone's civil rights, he's crushing everyone, he's taking away the right to free speech, this thing would be shut down in Russia right now, and we'd all be arrested if we were trying to have free speech now. So yeah, if you don't yeah. understand those things, yeah, explain yeah. to me why you don't. Well, thank you for that. Uh, uh, one part that you didn't mention about uh, Hitler's invasion of the Sudetenland is that it went on to be a full-scale invasion of all of uh, Eastern Europe and most specifically. It just means that so Putin skipped. A wait, wait, step. wait! I listened to you. I listened to you. Okay, good, and but don't thank you. be a thank you. Don't well, BS well, us. Just a minute. Don't if BS you, if, us. If, if if you want your question answered, you have to give me the right to answer it. And I don't need any insults into the bargain. The, the invasion by Nazi Germany of Eastern Europe and, and of, of the Soviet Union as a whole resulted in more than 27 million deaths. And really the wholesale destruction of all of European Russia. Uh, and it took uh, a significant major national effort to recover from that. And that was a very real difference from what actually is happening militarily with the Russian intervention in the Ukraine, which has been limited to uh, uh, Eastern Ukraine and specifically the areas where the Russian speakers are. And uh, uh, even- Such a lie. Okay. Uh, uh, let me just finish. He just fired a missile into Western Ukraine. Yeah, Western Ukraine, specifically to a, a training center on the border with Poland that was used by uh, the United States and NATO as a training operation. Uh, and uh, the other missile that landed there yesterday uh, was at an air base. Um, the, the only, those are the only two examples of military action in all Western the people Ukraine. killed that are civilians in kiev and kharkiv all right. all actually right. very few. they're all military targets all the civilians and all the hospitals actually that have been actually russia has surrounded <laughs> kiev and has actually uh consciously decided not to move in and doesn't want to move in it's it's this is a very tough thing for us to discuss based on u.s media reports which are full of propaganda uh, that make it sound like, in fact, uh, uh, Russia is doing exactly what the United States did in Iraq, which was carpet bombing, destroying tens of thousands of people. The number of, of uh, casualties so far in the Ukraine is uh, uh, so starkly different from what happened in Iraq that you need to analyze what is the real difference? Because there is one. That's all I have to say right now. All right, Tim, let's go to rebuttals. Let's go to it's rebuttal. All right, Doug, I know you want to go first, so I'll give everybody four minutes. Who let's else? Thank our speaker first. Thank okay, our speaker. that's good. I might as well do it while my dander's up, huh? All um. right, all right. Doug, we'll go first. <laughs> Ellen, you want to go next? And then Raj? Uh, I wouldn't mind going. 
Kelvin. And then I know Charlie's got one. All right, so I have right now, Doug, Ellen, Raj, Kelvin, and Charlie. Anybody else? Um, yeah, I'd like to give a rebuttal. Yeah, I'll put you, I'll, I'll put, I'll, mm -hmm. Ellen, I'll put you before Charlie. All right, we got five rebuttals. I'm going to go four minutes each. We got one, two, three, four, five, six rebuttals. I'm going to run a timer at four minutes. Okay, Raj, don't worry about your hand. I got you on the thing. I'll lower it now. Anybody else wants a rebuttal before we go finalize the list? I myself would like to do one myself, but I'm going to forego it tonight since I've been hosting quite a bit. Yeah, Frank. Uh, Frank, you want to go? Oh. Okay, Frank. Better go to three minutes. Well, we can go to three minutes if everybody's ready for it. Okay, then I'll go three minutes. All right. Uh, let me uh, get my online timer up. I'm going to hit, I'm going to hit a, a I'll go three minutes. It's going to be a firm three minutes. So uh, let's uh, get going. So uh, Doug, fire away. Okay, three, three minutes isn't nearly enough. But um, I just want to say I was very, um, very much inclined to be in favor of the speaker. D. I feel that uh, uh, all your work uh, against the Vietnam War and many of the other things you did. Uh, I also I marched uh, uh, against uh, uh, our government's uh, oppression of uh, the Nicaragua people and the people in El Salvador, things like that. All my life, I've been an activist against fascism and against oppression and against discrimination of people. I'm a liberal, I'm a proud liberal, but you have really gone bonkers. And I, the problem is, is that this Ukraine war and Putin has produced these differences in the United States. He's driven a wedge and the Russian propaganda has done that. And you can't see propaganda in front of your face. You're talking about the propaganda of our country. Well, really we have diversity in our country and thank goodness we do. But Putin is destroying democracy in the Soviet Union. And you can't see it. You can't see that he is a fascist. He's a dictator. If you were to go to the Soviet Union now, you'd be just you know, rounded up. Uh, if you tried to protest, you'd be rounded up like, how about that girl that went on for just two seconds and then she was taken off and she's probably going to be in prison for 15 years by putting one sign up. Okay, so that you just can't see that. I hope you do. I hope you figure it out. And I totally support Ernie. Uh, the other day, on this one in Dallas, I brought up this Budapest memorandum. It is a moral obligation of our country. Has nothing to do with NATO. We did it and when it was in our interest that Ukraine give up their nuclear weapons. They did that with the assurance that the United States and Russia and the UK would guarantee their borders. We have not guaranteed the borders because of course, Biden didn't really see this coming in the sense that if he had used that memorandum, it would have given him the opportunity to send our troops into Ukraine to at least intimidate Putin into not invading. Biden didn't really believe that Putin would pull a Hitler full on of what he did to Czechoslovakia, that he would do it without that step of taking over the state. And he didn't really need those provinces in the in the east. They're just bullshit talking points and garbage. He doesn't care about Russian speakers because he just about killed all the people in Kharkiv, which if you know anything about it, D, those are Russian speakers in Kharkiv. And he's bombed the place to smithereens. And the, unfortunately, you just have to learn something about the current situation, because if you hadn't gone on the crazy far left, which is really the same as the far right now, if you hadn't noticed Tucker Carlson and the crazies that are Putin apologists and have been that way for a long time, you suddenly become a Putin apologist. What is wrong with you? Just get your head screwed on straight now and late in your life so you don't do something stupid to ruin all the good things you did as a good liberal and a good activist. Okay, I'm done. All right. D, yeah, I, saw yeah, yeah. Of, yeah. D I saw a lot of your arguments that were posted that were right straight from RT television, believe it or not, when I was watching it the other day. But uh, all right, next is uh, next is Ellen, Ellen Corley. Go ahead, Ellen. Okay. Three minutes. Wow. Okay, thank you. Um, it's, this is really crazy times and I, it shows that propaganda is, you know, it's not 
the fact that they've got Doug so riled up against you, and I've had I've left wing friends, this Jeremy Hammond, just yell at me with that same tone, um, accusing me of being uh, crazy and and you know defriend him, and I'm a rabbit hole, and I'm Tucker Carlson, and I'm grabbing stuff off the internet and don't know what I'm talking about. It uh, it's horrifying the way they're divide and conquer get us against each other this was a plan of You're doing poop NATO. spinning i haven't finished this was the plan of nato gladio team b by reiner gellen hitler's head of intelligence against russia in 1948 47 when he created the gellen group alan dulles cia that with the formation of the national security act worked planned it with Reiner Gellin, Hitler's head of intelligence against Russia to leave behind armies. It's called Gladio, look it up, Daniel Ganser. And it, this, you know, Carl Schmidt and the Hitler's plan was you leave the strategy of tension, terrorist acts blamed on the other guys. So they did it in Nicaragua, they did it in Vietnam, they do it, you know, Operation Phoenix, America, you know, here 9-11, Iran-Contra, we have, this is, the fascism is not Russia, it's Germany and the United States and NATO, Gladio, terrorist, invisible shadow armies, secret government that is, you know, doing terrorist acts and you blame it on the Muslims so that you can take the Middle East. And now it's the Fourth Reich. And this is, they're doing, this is according to the game plan, it's in Rand, Chris Hedges, a good source is Salon Magazine, you know, um, has a bunch of articles on this. Chris Hedges has one, but I saw one that Rand Corporation planned this four years ago. I mean, this, this terrorist false flag weekly news, watch Kevin Barrett. And, you know, from the beginning, I, I follow this prevailing winds, Peter Dale Scott, um, P Parenti, uh, you know, this whole left wing, you know, inspired that you were part of, and I'm a part of, Doug was a part of, but all of a sudden with, they, you know, got us with the propaganda, uh, you know, there's no middle anymore. And I mean, I used to think there's no such thing as a left wing, uh, you know, extremist. I can't be too left wing, but people are really calling me you know something i'm not and it, what it is you have what to a criminal you? state there's a criminal state our cia our fbi our nsa hey, Ellen, three minutes is up. in these guys there's a criminal state and you guys don't see it so you All think right. we're, we're right. Right. three minutes so are up Russia for CIA. okay it. that's us okay it's not russia it's the cia and the fbi it's charlie and oh, and there's an yeah. invisible propaganda I'm, I'm, mechanism. I'm, 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 all right ellen that's I'm good enough all you. right rog you're next <laughs> uh ellen Conley, you are right at <laughs> this time okay i, I what is happening to us is that uh, we are destroying our own country we we just can't can get along in among ourselves and uh, we are hate people, and uh, uh, just it it looks like uh, in time to hate everybody else in the world and going to wars wherever we can, and uh, we create excuses, we create a alibis, and we create a, a devilify them and say, wow, you know they are devil, okay, and so we got to destroy them, and we are destroying ourselves. You know, wherever you go in a country right now, people are nervous, they are frustrated, they are lonely. You know, just, just if love is not there, actually, if, if there is anything. We, we are, America has been so fearful. Very first day I came in this country, and I have about 50 students, I was sitting, I said, what's wrong with communism? And everybody always stood up. I said, what's wrong with communism? We are so brainwashed that time. This is the most evil. And the communism had not, not much power those days, back in 1965. And they were all scared. And Vietnam War happened. It's because we were fearful of communism. And that's what happened. And we are fearful of something or other thing. But the, Biden doesn't have to go to Russia. He wanted to go to Russia 
for years and years and years. He did not like Putin and he thought he got an opportunity. He pushed and pushed and pushed Zelensky to, you know, this look, you know, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. He put out every day, when is going to happen, who says war, what is, and that's crazy. President of the United States, he should be creating a peace, he should be creating a situation and say, hey, come on, we, are, we, we don't want this war and let's figure it out how to solve this problem. And Biden did not do it. I voted for Biden two times and three times, and I'm probably voting for him again, but I, we have to figure it out, how to control our politicians, how to control our, our candidates and our president and get solid commitment from them of no war. Thank you. Okay, Raj, you're, um, Kelvin, you're next. Three minutes. Okay, um, let's, Doug talked about uh, the analogies between uh, Putin and Hitler and the invasion of the Sudetenland. Let's assume, uh, D, that you are not the guy, you, we were not born in the 50s or early, late 40s, then you were, you were born in 1920 something, right? You're in America in 1936, 1934, right? And you're saying exactly the same things. You're saying, why don't we get the other side of Nazi Germany? You know, without, look at all the roads they built. Look at that, the, the low unemployment. Look at the uh, look at the prosperity. Um, you know, yes, of course, there's some racial tensions. Yes, of course, there's. But why don't we get here? Do you? Would you be on like the Lindbergh uh, America First side, or would you be saying, or would you be the type of guy that would uh, volunteer to, to to fight in Spain, like my grandfather I mean, was? I'd I'd want to fight in Spain. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, so <laughs> another thing is is that we need to get rid of the nukes. What America has said to the rest of the world over the, the past few years is A, you're not to be trusted. And B, the Second Amendment works in the fact that uh, America has betrayed its allies. It betrayed the Kurds and it's betrayed, it's betrayed the Ukrainians, which, we, which America and the, uh, and, and, and the UK promised to protect. Now, the Ukraine gave up their nuclear weapons. Does, I want to straw poll here anybody who thinks that Russia would have invaded Ukraine if they still had nuclear weapons. Come on. Anybody thinks that? Anybody think that? Well, I think it might it's a be false better. question. No, no it, it isn't. isn't. If they had, if they had three hundred, no, no, they were, pro they were, pro they were. Are you promised. kidding me? False promise. False promise. I mean, let's be real. Let's show you reality here. <laughs> okay, Kelvin, I'm going to, since you're done talking, I'm going to shut, um, I'm going to ask that uh, Frank go next. So Frank, you're up on uh, for the okay. rebuttal. Okay. Uh, I first of all want to congratulate Dee for his whole career. I mean, it's, it's amazing. To be honest, Nee, I hadn't heard of you before. Um, I'm very impressed with you. I'm total, totally with you on uh, all of your policies, actually. It's amazing. Um, now, Bernie gave a, a really good speech in the floor of the Senate um, against, uh, I mean, he said the U.S. should take into account um, Ukraine security concerns, and uh, he was right on point. Of course, our own Senator Dick Durbin responded to him. Dick Durbin didn't understand what on earth Bernie was talking about, evidently. Um, but we don't see Bernie Sanders on CNN or MSNBC putting forward his point of view. Um, uh, and we don't see any contrary voices on CNN or MSNBC putting forward a point of view which is calling for peace in Ukraine. Uh, in fact, there are no calls for peace by the media. The media keep asking the politicians questions, what are you going to do more to help Ukraine? Uh, they keep asking questions about the no-fly zone. They keep asking questions about more weapons. And remember, the U.S. Congress has voted for huge amounts of money not to go to Ukraine, actually, but to go to the weapons manufacturers. 
It's the weapons that go to Ukraine, not the money, all of these billions of dollars that the US is spending. And of course, if the US is spending those billions of dollars on weapons, that means Medicare for all, it means various social programs in this country, uh, fixing infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera, Green New Deal, they go out the window because we're spending so much money on defense. Um, now, D, the DSA, I'm assuming, D, that you had a hand in writing the DSA statement from the International Committee? Yes. <clears throat> Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, excellent. The DSA statement from the International Committee was right on point. Uh, later on, the DSA Political Committee issued, I think, a, a similar statement. Um, but we don't hear any of these uh, statements on the news or on CNN or MSNBC. Um, and most Americans, in my view, to be honest, like Doug, <laughs> can't see the propaganda that we're facing uh, from our own domestic sources. They accuse us. I mean, I'm with, uh, who was it, Ellen? I mean, I've been accused of all sorts of things, supporting genocide, blah, blah, blah. I'm a Putin stooge. I listen to RT and all the rest of it. It's uh, Russian talking points. I mean, we're being really taken through the grinder on our, on our position. Um, but I think that we understand enough by understanding the history of this whole affair. We understand how this situation got to where it is. And most people have no understanding whatsoever of how this situation got to be. And of course, the difficult issue is that Putin is a monster. I mean, it, 15 years for protesting against the, the, uh, the uh, Ukrainian war. I mean, that's, that's absolutely terrible. Uh, so, but we're not defending Putin's regime. And that's what people don't understand. We do not support regime, US regime change strategies. That's what they did with Iraq. Thousands of people died. Uh, we've got, as Dee mentioned, the, uh, the um, sanctions on Cuba. That's inhumane. That in itself should be classified as a war crime. How can you do that to a country for 60 odd years? That's absolutely disgusting. Right. Now, in terms of Ukraine being in NATO, you, the Russia sees that Ukraine is actually a de facto NATO country already. It's not officially in NATO, but you've had British special forces there, British trainers, Canadian trainers, US special forces, the CIA. They've been helping the neo-Nazis on, on the front line in Donbass. They've been training them in sniper shooting, uh, in insurgency techniques. So the US has been very active, plus the British, of course, we know the British are always the lapdog of America, Tony Blair and George Bush. Um, so that's just what I want to say. Thanks. Okay. Enough. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, Ellen H., you got to say anything real quick? Okay. Yes. Um, Three minutes. But by the way, I, I, I heard probably decades ago um, that... Um, with our um, the, um, embargo, uh, how, how we don't allow um, supply um, our sanctions on Cuba, that um, they actually were able to access insulin. So uh, that would result in a lot of dead people. Now, hopefully that's changed. That was like decades ago. Uh, I heard about that. Um, yeah, I, I agree that um, Putin is a monster. Um, and there is a democracy in Russia, but I think we also, but I think we have to also turn our attention to the undemocratic type forces that are going on here in the United States, and some really troubling issues which are going on in the United States. Um, first of all, I think the media has contributed to a great polarization of of the people, and um, one thing I noticed. Um, many years ago was, you know, um, people have to have a foundation and they have to understand things like morals and that other people with different views are human and they aren't necessarily evil. They aren't necessarily the devil. So, um, a long time ago, I was, I was listening to, um, uh, 720 AM and I was surprised to hear one of um, the talk show hosts um, called ISIS members roaches. Uh, this is what Hitler called the Jews. We have to be very careful the way 
Um, we go around dehumanizing people. This is a very, very dangerous thing. And I see liberals engaging in this a lot. Um, I also was at a Northside BFA, Democracy for America meeting, um, this, uh, the liberals. And um, this woman who had ran for um, uh, mayor of Bolingbrook um, unsuccessfully uh, called her opponent a turd. Um, uh, this this tendency to dehumanize other people is very dangerous and, and is what um, the, the Jews experienced and other people that um, genocide is committed on them. It's, it's due to uh, uh, um, dehumanization is a huge part of it. Um, we have a very serious problem with our media. Um, it is um, the media, um, big tech is, is a proxy for the government, the government is pressuring, pressuring, pressuring big tech to censor, and they're doing that. Um, so th that's a curtailing of the First Amendment. I mean, if you don't have the First Amendment, you, you have no constitution. Um, and um, I'll okay, just give Ellen. you an example. That, okay, Ellen, um, your three minutes are up. Okay, okay, that's fine. All right, Charlie, you're next. You're next. All right. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank our speaker, Dean Knight. Number one, thank you for your five decades of uh, activities, activism. And number two, I'd like to thank you for a very interesting presentation and fielding uh, uh, questions from the uh, student body. I have five issues that I will cover very quickly. Number one, we heard some UN bashing earlier. I've been a member of the United Nations Association for decades. And not long ago, we had the Young World Federalist here, which I've been become more active with. So uh, yes, it's a good organization. Could it be better? Every organization could be, uh, but we have to put our support of our nation, if we elect a statesman and put enthusiasm behind it, it can be unite the world for accomplishment of good issues. Number two, I don't know if anybody else is here, but you mentioned I also was at the Democratic Convention in 68. So I guess I, I, I go back with you a few years here. But yeah, I partook in the events um, regarding it. Um, let's see, I, I should add that my brother uh, was a war, uh, went to Canada during the Vietnam conflict. Uh, so I'm familiar with a lot of what you were discussing. It was personal to me. Uh, he took a permanent residence in Canada uh, uh, and did not return to the United States except to visit. Uh, one other thing I'd like to bring to mind uh, regarding invading, uh, who are we gonna support? There was some reference to Lithuania uh, by Jake. Uh, Lithuania has been a member of NATO for quite a few year, years now, and the Lithuanian forces, much as they are, uh, has fought by, side by side with American soldiers. So I don't think you can renege on them, their efforts in that regard. Now, the other thing about the media, only reporting on the bad things that the Russians are doing. Well, I don't know what you report on, when an army invades a nation, they're not bringing gifts to the people. They're there for no good reason. So I don't understand what the media is not reporting on what the wonderful thing the Russian army is doing doesn't quite compute in my intellect, but that doesn't seem to bother some of you. Anyhow, thank you again. Hope you return sometime with an update and uh, put together a program now that you know the lay of land. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. All right, before we let our speaker get our last word in, I will say there is some hope for cooperation between Russia and America. And if you look at the International Space Station, we still have very active ties between us, Russia and the European Union in keeping this thing alive and afloat. And maybe we could learn something from our scientific colleagues. That's all I'm going to say on it. Thank you. Okay, okay Jim. Uh, Jim, how are you going?
Tim, how you can say that? It's very nice, actually, you say that. But I would like to ask Mr. D, if it's really possible to on this at least one person. The question period is over, Tim. This, no, hold on one second, Charlie. Okay, if it's possible, at least one person. Just silence, Operation. Tim. Just silence. Mana, 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 Mana. I don't think so. Cold War going on. For well, okay. Silence, okay. please. And it's sorry, okay. you know. Everybody would like to have peace between America. Oh, no, no, Lana, I was just and simply I saying that there is a sense that we are, that, that I just pointed out because I just want to say there was some hope of cooperation. Yeah, maybe All right. hope. Uh, yeah. All right. That, uh, D, you get the last word and uh, you can take as long as you need to uh, rebut us or just say good night. And I appreciate you coming tonight. I mean, well, I, I don't agree with you more, more along the lines of Doug Binkley, but. You know, I have sometimes have to restrain myself. Everybody, I want to appreciate before we go. I want to appreciate the cooperation I had tonight with our rebutters and our everybody here. It seemed to what <coughs> what could potentially be a very combative night, very disciplined, very well done. And I really want to appreciate and compliment all of you for keeping yourselves under some semblance of discipline tonight. So thank you very much, D. Please take it over. Okay. Well, I I want to also thank everyone. Uh, for what was a very, very uh, lively uh, discussion. Uh, some of the uh, stuff that I uh, tried to bring up in the first part of the talk uh, was overshadowed by the Ukraine crisis, but that's very natural and I don't object. Uh, I was uh, uh, glad that people were able to hear some of what I said uh, and uh, found some things to agree with. I would like to say uh, something about the future, knowing, for example, that even the worst wars end. Uh, the U.S. war in Vietnam came to an end. It took a long, long time. It affected the world in ways that we're still dealing with. And uh, hopefully this war in Ukraine can uh, be ended much, much sooner. I absolutely do not think that the way to uh, achieve justice as well as peace is by intensifying and expanding the war. I think the way is to uh, intensify negotiations and find points of agreement that are right there in front of us and right there in front of uh, uh, what I would call not just both sides, but all sides, and that there is a future for actually for mutual respect between uh, the uh, governments and peoples of Europe and those of Russia and also uh, uh, the United States. And I think that we also need to be aware that much of the reason that, uh, in my opinion, uh, the U.S. government is pushing for intensification of the war in Ukraine is because they want to fight not only with Russia, but with China. It will be a disaster if it happens, and we need to uh, uh, dig in deeper to understand what is going on and not depend only on official sources. Uh, I could say much more, but won't out of respect for the strong, strong feelings of those who are depending mainly on uh, official uh, government and mainstream media reports. Uh, just ask that you try and find additional sources. They're not all coming from Russia. Uh, I would, for example, uh, uh, refer people to uh, Scott Ritter's analysis of the, uh, of the military situation. I would uh, suggest that uh, you look at uh, multipolarista.com where you can find uh, the very good research of uh, uh, Ben Norton who's actually in Nicaragua and is able to find a whole range of sources. We should know that despite the wholesale condemnation of the Russian military intervention in, the U uh, in Ukraine, in the United States and Europe, uh, uh, more than half the world has not gone along with that. Uh, and there may be good reasons for that. Uh, and I'm referring to uh, peoples and governments in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. 
uh, as well as the Middle East. Um, and we need to look beyond the current heat to uh, uh, what can possibly come in the future once the situation uh, that exists in the Ukraine has been settled, which I believe it will be settled uh, relatively soon. But I do believe it's necessary to pressure the United States to stop talking about uh, no-fly zones and start talking about finding a route to peace. And that's where I'll leave it. I want to just mention, uh, I think I put it in the chat, that uh, for those who want more about what I've written, you can go to dnight.blog to find it. Um, and if you want to get my book right now, because you just can't wait, you can find it at 1804books.com slash product slash uh, My Whirlwind Lives. And I, look, I, I uh, would love to come back at some point. Uh, and I uh, express my heartfelt thanks for your kind invitation and your patient um, uh, listening and uh, lively debate. Thanks again. Okay, at, the, at this point, we'll keep the uh, Zoom call open. I am gonna declare the College of Complexes tonight adjourned. And although you have a good night. Thank you very much.